And that, yeah, that's something that I'm actually. <laughs> This is a very personal moment for me. I'm, we do, str- I'm we struggling. We do a lot with of that. those on this podcast. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's it's a it's a combination of um, being too too busy and doing all of my interaction through the internet mm-hmm. with people, and that was that was how I operated for like the past like couple years, and so like I go out to like bars like with friends and stuff, and it's like I find it hard to make conversation. Oh, that's true. Yeah, and oh, these are oh, like it's rough. these are important people to me i mean it's the same thing with my family like i don't talk to my family as much as i should mm-hmm. anymore i don't either and it's because it just becomes too easy to jump on instagram and they're guilty of it too to jump on instagram see what i posted that day shoot a like and it's like that's an i love you yeah oh yeah. yeah isn't that strange it hurts. scary as it hell. hurts to think and about so it. like i i noticed this about myself a few months ago i'm like i'm like man i'm i'm fucking awkward yeah. I should actually do one of the, one of those, mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, all right, there we go. We're cool. here. We're alive. What does it even mean? All right. Well, also, are is it what does it even I know, mean? I, or what does I kind of did mean? that on purpose because oh in God. like, and when I say it out loud, it's what does it even mean? Right. But when I think it, it's what does that? The title even mean? is like what does that even mean? Yeah, I kind of like liked, I like the the yeah. the. Uh, all right, I'm glad we agreed on that yeah. one. All right, let's get the drinks going. This right. might be a new. Uh, this might be a new. Um, I think it helps. It kind of. Uh, lubricates the mind. Oh yeah, I'll let you pour your own then. I don't want to take too much. I don't What'd know you how do? Much two fingers. There. Yeah, it's about a finger and a half. I'll buy more Blantons for next time. Leave some for our buddy take, over there. Take a little more. That's yeah, good. Perfect. Thank you. So what is this is just bourbon? It's just bourbon. I really okay. I I consider this a sipping bourbon. It looks like a it looks like a scotch. Yeah. It's it's a you know there's some bourbons that are okay to sip to do shots, but I I like I really like this bourbon. I think it's Yeah, it's smooth and sweet and simple. wonderful, yeah. Cool man. All right. So I I think that what we were just talking about would be an interesting way to start because it's uh Do you guys uh, I hate to interrupt. Do you guys do a, an intro to your podcast? No. We would take any uh, a- any recommendations. Maybe yeah, you should, should uh, you should I, definitely incorporate an intro. Okay, because yeah. I think that that helps everybody. Like, because yeah, right. brand it. We agree. I I, I agree with you 100. percent We we still have a, a number of decisions to make about everything in terms of like content, guests, general. Yeah, we were talking general about presentation. This. Yeah, we were talking about this this week, and I, I got I, I went into wall of text mode. You know, yes, like, I noticed. We all did. It was yeah, Vince, Vince asked if we were a political podcast, and I sent him <laughs> about a book, a book of why I don't like that label. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, I just wanted to ask you. We usually record the intro after the podcast. Mm. Mm. We'll do that. Mm. That makes sense. Okay, so you could do an intro per podcast. Yeah, you really... you, that's you usually would want to. Oh, you I, thought different... you meant, I thought you meant like a universal it, thing. Well, it gets really grating when I find a series i enjoy even if it's on youtube and i have to sit through the same same 30 seconds mm-hmm. every time so you're saying maybe like find a little short clip that right. kind of summarizes something you do you would just do it at the end of the podcast you do one for every episode you just do a little short i'm like, really hey. I'm, yeah i mean uh, i'm I like really that. okay with you know having the same kind of like sh- i mean we've just been doing like welcome to episode number three of you know what does that even mean and then we just jump right in yeah i think that's kind of simple enough but if if we get deeper into it we might think of a different kind of intro. i kind of uh, some some people do this i like this i like the idea of if you can find something that somebody says that's interesting and you're curious about where that goes mm-hmm. and you cut that out and you put that at the yeah, beginning the most interesting part of the podcast you know, like, just tease it that's a good idea yeah like the most interesting thing seconds, somebody yeah. said you, we could compete for it too like we'd vote on what was the most <laughs> yeah uh, some we'll go through and pick out a whole bunch of them yeah, we could vote idea. on who's uh could compete for it cool but back to back to instagram sorry Okay, yeah. Instagram. Just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I love Instagram, but there's definitely a certain like culture on it that really, really sucks. Mm. Yeah. Um, so it's mostly with photography. Cause like I think Instagram's fine when you use it as like your personal like Facebook page. Because Facebook's dead as far as I'm concerned. Everybody's <laughs> just kind of moved to Instagram and Twitter. Um but like the photography culture on Instagram is so grating on my mind. Especially like um, on a local level, because you see a lot. We have a term for some of these people, mostly the male ones. Um, we call them GWCs. 
okay. which stands for guys with cameras <laughs> instead of photographers. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. I, I know that I know who you're talking about actually. Yeah. It's like you I go on there and see they, their Instagram page. They jack clarity to like 70% <laughs> yeah. in Lightroom. I do that. Do you? I mean, I, I use, I, I'm not a photographer. Oh yeah, but that's, I, but that's the difference. You don't claim to be. Admits no, to I yeah. just, yeah. I'm doing it because it makes my pictures look better than they were. Mm -hmm. But like, if I was a real photographer, if I was a real photographer and I was using Instagram filters, I think I'd not feel so good about myself. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong there. That's maybe I'm being a little, maybe I'm looking no, I, romanticizing it a little bit but instagram filters are for like uh, they're just for um they're not for photographers i don't think they're no, for, not at all yeah the, there's a, another problem with instagram which is the um it's fast you know like mm -hmm. for, for photographers especially you know if i'm gonna go look at photography i don't i'm not gonna swipe by it you know i'm not gonna scroll past it i'm gonna stand in front of it and look at it for a little while there's actually uh if you ever go to chicago I want you to go to this uh, gallery. This guy is a photographer, and whatever he does is fascinating. I'd just be interested to see what you think about it. But that's I'm mm -hmm. I'm going on a tangent. The point is, if you go to a gallery where somebody takes photographs for a living and they're make they're selling these for like millions of dollars, you stand there and you look at it and you you take it in. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had the same debate with music. We I talked to um a bunch of people the other night about how uh. I, when I go to a show, I'm there to listen to the music. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard the little clipping thing. It didn't do it for me. It right. might, it might just be um, our our headphones. Didn't. It probably is. It's probably the yeah. But it's you know what I mean though. Like, if you go, you can't really appreciate someone's art on Instagram. Not if you're using Instagram the way that Instagram was designed to be used. Yeah, I agree. I um. There's something that I said the other day when I was talking to I mean Zach were having the exact same conversation and um it's I think it's a problem with all mediums of art and the internet. It's mm -hmm. so like video killed radio. I think content is just killing craft. Completely agree. It's it's like just the the endless pursuit of creating content is kind of draining the quality. It's a it's a quantity over quality culture on the mm -hmm. internet. I had a, this exact thought today, and I'm glad I wanted to talk about it, but I wasn't sure we'd be able to. Um, in the past, I imagine, I mean, it, I wasn't there, but I imagine going to see something, some art that had been curated or whatever, it was a big deal, like you're there for the art. Today, that doesn't seem so true. You know, you go on Spotify not to, not to appreciate the music, but to listen to the music, which is... And it's a passive listen almost all the time. Uh, you go on Instagram and you see pictures like that and you're, you're passively looking at it. You're like, that's cool. That's cool. You might, you might go look at their other pictures. You're like, that's as far as you're really going to go. Um, well, so, but, but I think that people, human beings, they, they do have to latch on to something. Mm -hmm. And right now, what they seem to be doing, like they, they can't seem to figure out how to latch on to the content. Like how to latch on to the music or the or the the movie or the whatever, but they are very interested in the story of the artist. They're very interested in that. That's where to use an analogy. You go to a show, right? You go to a show. People we know, and people will enjoy the music, but passively they'll talk. Mm -hmm. But then if the if after the show they go to the merch table and the artist is there they're totally there like it's a hundred percent that's your moment that's the moment you get them because that's where they they get i feel like i get to know you as a person i get to like i get to ask you a question about who you are or what your music is you know like that's the thing there's this sort of people are starving for like a person oh i lost you there yeah, for we, a second. we all cut it yeah. out yeah that was weird it might be the uh it might be the uh microphone amplifier so I'm going to assume it's still yeah, recording. I, I noticed the, the cable here is when you push it in all the way, it only does one. Here. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's like that. Oh, boy. It was a very cheap microphone amplifier. <clears throat> I cheaped out on a couple of things. It doesn't look like anything cut out, so I'll keep an yeah, eye on it. I but. think it's fine on a computer. Um, yeah, I think, I think people are starving for a personal connection, and I think that's a big side effect of social media, which mm -hmm. isn't necessarily a bad thing. The bad thing is a lack of personal connection on social media, and I think that's starting to percolate to the top as far as society goes. People are like, man, 
my life does not feel real because you sit in your apartment all day and yeah. the only interaction you have with people who you consider to be your friends is purely virtual. Well, with, with media, like everything else on the internet, it's, it's, it happens in a place where your appetite is constantly getting shorter and shorter every, every minute. I mean, like we've, it's been like, you know, 10 or 15 years now since we've made the internet a regular part of our lives and we are, we are just kind of reprogrammed. We talked about this a little bit last week, but we are, we're so accustomed now to getting whatever we want, whenever we want it, any kind of information, whether it's in the form of text or video or audio or whatever it is, it's too easy to, to look for what I want and, and I don't have an incentive to take the time and appreciate something new. Ironically, unless it's in the physical world, like there's tons of hipsters out there that'll talk your ear off about their favorite bourbon or beer. There's so many <laughs> beers out there now, mm-hmm. microbreweries doing beer and coffee. And I like that stuff too, but like I think the reason millennials are so into it is because it's one of the, it's one of the few passions left that you can't simulate on the internet. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. tangible. It's very true. You, you kind of rea- like you can realize you know the, the the thing about the music in- the music industry has kind of started to adjust. Mm-hmm. It's really like there's no real money in streaming left. I mean, unless you're Spotify or like the biggest streaming streaming service. Everyone else that you know that the word on the street is if you want to make money as a musician, it's like all all that money comes from for performances now because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that's the only thing you you that's real that you can't get. Yeah, there's a snap of your fingers on the internet. There's also. To, to counter that, and I'm kind of using a social media example, counter example, but there's things like Patreon too, oh, which yeah. is which is like a weird thing. It's trying <clears throat> to, I'm, I'm really responding to you saying that's where the money is. Cause I think you can make money mm-hmm. in different ways in the, in the arts, but mm-hmm. I know what you mean. You kind of have to give your content away for free at this right. point. There's not much you can do about it. People aren't gonna pay for music. People yeah. aren't gonna pay for a lot of things and they'll, they'll they're not, I mean, I don't know, like movies and stuff, but people will pay to go see a movie in a theater or they'll pay a streaming service, but they're not going to pay. I, I imagine, I don't know the numbers, but I don't know how much people pay to watch a video on YouTube unless that they're rent, like they see it as a rental of a movie, of a big movie. Does uh, YouTube Red share their um, their data like, like Netflix? Has- I don't know. It cut out again. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Did it, did, but it. It's not the scroll bar is not staying with it. I think it's it looks. Which one are you? No, it didn't. It doesn't look like it cut out. I'll All try right. to keep. We'll just ignore it then. It is what it is. We'll figure it out. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think. I think the appetite's getting. It's changing like it's getting shorter, but I think people are still like, they need the same amount of nourishment. And they just don't know how to get it now. That's true. And so that's I. Th- that's why, like, you see this resurgence of analog culture across all the mediums. Like, You're absolutely right. That's, that's great very putting true. It. Like, Kodak um, is having a resurgence in their rebranding because of the resurgence of, like, analog photography. Mm-hmm. And then vinyl is the analog medium oh, yeah. for, mm-hmm. for music that's coming back. And I I think you're just going to see a lot of that in, in, like, the years to come, especially with, like, um, not not millennials, but, like, what is it, Gen, Gen X or is it Gen Z? Gen Z. Gen Z is right below us. Yeah. So Gen Z, like my, um, I like my to niece, call, I refer to them as the meme team. Yeah. <laughs> my niece is 12 going on 13 and sh- she asked for a, uh, Fujifilm Instax camera for, for Christmas. Wow. An analog, That's great. An analog <laughs> I camera. Never, I never would have imagined that yeah. happening, you know, when I was 12. No. Yeah. To be fair though. I mean, I started buying vinyl. I remember I listened to my father's, my parents' vinyl at home and, uh, my I rem- my dad asked me like why the hell are you going to record stores like what are you doing buying buying vinyl mm-hmm. I was buying them in college and after that and I was like I was like honestly I'm not I, one there's a part of me that just loved the sound of it like when you played a record when we were younger there's just a, a sound to it that's feels tangible mm-hmm. for lack of a better word and there's also the there's an album art aspect to it and there's this like ownership like. You don't feel ownership of a, a, an iTunes album you downloaded, yeah. you know, or, but you feel an ownership of like, I got those I, and I feel good about them. They feel, I like that they're in my house. How about that? I like to have a, te- a, a testament to, to music in my house. It's like a four dimensional, it's a multi-dimensional experience. It's like reading a book. Like you, you can feel the page, you can smell it. So true. Even the like the sound of t- turning a page. I don't, I don't know how weird people get with it, but like it's the same thing with vinyl. I mean, you, there's like a certain smell to them when they, especially when they're older, it's the same thing. And then like with analog photography, um, like I can't, like I don't enjoy shooting digital photography. Like I can do it 
and obviously it's probably more efficient, but I feel for me, I feel like I'm working, but also there's just like the satisfaction with film advance and like, no, like you can imagine in your mind how the film is interacting with the light coming through the lens of the camera, just through the sound of the mechanism working. And that's, I think that's something that humans are always going to have a, uh, an affinity for. And that's the, the best example of that is books. Like the fact that there are still like brick and mortar bookstores doesn't make any goddamn sense, but there is. Right. I just, the other day I went and bought a, you know, flesh and blood copy of, uh, George Orwell's 1984. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. We, you said and that. It, yeah. And it's a lot of fun to just like read in bed. It's, it's a, it's a good way to kill time. Um, it's a good way to keep my eyes off of screens, ironically, and off of the internet. Yeah. You have to justify the purchase a little more too. Like if I buy, uh, it I, feels more important yeah. what I'm reading because I paid for it. If I buy 10 eBooks, mm-hmm. I don't really know. You know, they're just yeah. there. They're in the ether somewhere. Yeah. But if I buy a book and it's on my counter every day, mm-hmm. it kind of holds me accountable for not reading it. Yeah. There's a, there's a, it's a real thing. It's, it's there and I'm a jerk because I haven't read it. I bought it and I didn't read it. And I live in an apartment. So when I buy books and records and stuff, I think about, it, I'm like, I'm gonna have to move that shit someday. Yeah. And so like, that's it better true. be a damn good book or record. <laughs> Cause that shit's heavy. That's true. That's very true. Wow, I didn't expect to talk about this today. We, you, um, there are other repercussions of this sort of uh, living on the internet. How much? What percentage would you say that people live on the internet today, or or what rate is the increase? That's so hard because I, once you start detaching yourself, like you guys, yeah, I, I've heard you say a couple times, and I want to talk to you today also about the speech that I I, I went to. Mm. about the early Facebook investor, but everyone's around me is saying like, you know, Facebook is dead. And I go like, Oh, I just assumed everyone still used it. Cause I've been off it for like two years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's for you, normies. Yeah. Well, I guess it's so. <laughs> but what does that mean? I, I don't, I don't have it on my phone. I still have a Facebook page. Interesting. I got rid of the page altogether. Yeah. I, I, got, I would love to do that. I think I, <clears throat> I, I dabble with the, the idea of downloading all my data and then just deleting it. Um, Mm -hmm. the reason I don't is because my two business partners tell me that I need to have a Facebook for our business so I can share our posts and shit. Well, there's a business Facebook is a little bit different. Yeah. And we have a page, but like it's, it's sharing it with your, with your friends. Cause that's just like three to 400 more people I can reach. I think one of the reasons Facebook is becoming, you know, unpopular is because once people realize they could capitalize on having their entity or their brand on Facebook. Uh, it, you know, everyone, everyone has a component of them that, that is business minded or, or professional. And people just started making their Facebook lives a professional pursuit. And all of a sudden it's like, nobody, nobody uses Facebook for their friends. It's like, I want to know about this event. I want to know about this gig. I want to know about this artist. I want to know about this business. Except our parents. Except for, yeah. except their parents. Our they parents, really get it. They reconnect with old friends and stuff, which is cool. Yeah, I, so I don't, cool. I, I shouldn't say Facebook is dead. It's just different now. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's not, um, oh, absolutely. It's not modern anymore. Well, that's one of the reasons I left was because uh, it's not modern. That's a good point. It's a mm-hmm. really good point. It's very not modern. But I, you know, I, it's like, I don't need to keep track of my friends via Facebook. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm trying to keep track of someone via Facebook, they're not my friend. You yeah. know, I, I feel much more. And it's weird. And, you know, one of the things you said, it was like when we spend so much time in our apartments and all of our relationships become digital, it's weird, right? It's weird <laughs> that I can go like, oh, I got a text message. This That felt special, right? Mm-hmm. It's weird. It's different. But it's like ever since getting rid of my Facebook, I call people more often. I text people more often, like personal things like, how was your day today? Do you need to go grocery shopping? I'll give you a ride. Do you want to meet up and, and hang out and talk in person? And obviously, like, that's done a lot for my actual interpersonal relationships. But it's funny that, like, you know, 20 years ago, we thought cell phones were going to de- destroy relationships. And mm-hmm. then we went too far with Facebook and Instagram. And so it's like, it's gla- I'm glad when I have people that I can text at any hour of the night or something like that. And that, yeah, that's something that I'm actually. <laughs> This is a very personal moment for me. I'm we do, str- I'm we do a lot of that. those on this podcast. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's it's a, it's a combination of um, being too too busy and doing all of my interaction through the internet mm-hmm. with people. And that was that was how I operated for like the past like couple years. And so like I go out to like bars like with friends and stuff and it's like I find it hard to make conversation. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And All these are the, like rough. these are important people to me. I mean, it's the same thing with my family. Like I don't talk to my family as much as I should mm-hmm. anymore. 
I don't either. And it's because it just becomes too easy to jump on Instagram, and they're guilty of it too. To jump on Instagram, see what I posted that day, shoot a like, and it's like that's an I love you. Yeah. Oh man. Ooh. Yeah. Isn't that strange? It's it hurts. scary as it hurts hell. To think and about. so like I I noticed this about myself a few months ago. I'm like. I'm like, man, I'm I'm fucking awkward. I think there's something I think there's something to be said that like, you know, you you develop a little bit differently if you don't have any family on social media. My parents never used it. My mm-hmm. dad can't even text, shoot a text message. So I feel very like behind, like in terms of like almost every forging any kind of new relationship I just compare it to my parents. And then I go, it's weird when people ask me for my Instagram or, or whatever. And I go like, Oh, I don't have one. Have you had a phase? I mean, you're a little different situation because you're in college. So you, there's a sort of social environment there. Wait, I'm in grad school. This is the, it's still you're way. Still, way. <laughs> you're still in school. Yes. Like you're still I'm in student. school. I'm a student. Yeah. And there's a there's a, a communal environment there where it's like you talk to people and whatever. Mm-hmm. But when you're a lone adult and you go out, have you ha- have you gone through the phase of the awkwardness of starting a conversation with a total stranger? Well, but, I weirdly no. The thing is, I'm really good at that part. I don't. I, I am now. I'm good. I'm good at the. I'm good at the introduction part and the shaking hands mm. and the eye contact part. The problem is like, I'm great at the in person part. It's when I get someone's phone number that I go like, oh, am I bothering them? <laughs> do, I, do I stop? It's like it's too intimate. We've talked about. We talked about this in the first episode, but it's like you know, we, we came up with this example of dating. It's like you know. What was it like a long time ago? Like a woman would be insane to like tell some man she just met where she lived, like her address, right? Like here's yeah. a key to my front door. You can come say hi whenever you want. You would never do that in a million years, right? Mm-hmm. But today you get someone's phone number and you have 24 hour access to them. <laughs> Even yeah. texting, it's it's too intimate. That and, and that's you why have, you can get their entire their entire life history because like if you go yeah. on if you no, go you're on right. Facebook, you can see everything. You can about, search a phone number and if they make it public, yep. nuts. I want to I want to respond to what you said about I know exactly what you're talking about with that awkwardness mm-hmm. because I had a phase like that and um a long kind of a long phase and it, it's definitely due to that like um you, like I'm a software engineer I spend all day on the computer and a lot of that is on the internet and then all of my social connections started to be on the internet and then it's it's like wow. You're not alone though. I mean, well, you feel I, well, I was not f- a computer scientist at twelve or thirteen yeah. or fourteen, but I was around that age. We were probably it was probably around the same time in history, even though we were at different ages. That everyone's it was just too easy to to meet people on the internet, sure. well, shoot you the also, shit on the internet, and like you start to feel almost locked in the group of friends you're in, right? Like the people, the like say actual friends, the right. people you actually hang mm-hmm. out with and see. And then I was in a situation where doesn't matter but i i was in a different spot in life than they were you know i, I had different would would our paths had mm-hmm. changed and i don't hold anything against them and i'm sure they don't hold anything against me uh but i needed to go out and like talk to people and it was like i don't know how to do this and i did a couple of things like um moving to downtown troy helped a lot because it's it's a it's a great environment like there's so many cool people like that helped. I started fostering dogs, which helped a little bit because, you know, you're kind of forced to, to once a week go out and interact with people. And then I started just, I got my own dog and I would just walk around Troy, just walk around and just talk to people, just, just interact. Like I just, oh, if I overheard a conversation, I wasn't embarrassed about it. Mm-hmm. I decided I'm not going to feel embarrassed by the fact that I know what they're talking about. That's how we met. I'm actually, yeah, oh, yeah? that's exactly what you did. Right. I did that scene. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. And it's how it's, it's most people, like you said, they're starved for that sort of human connection. So in our minds, we think if I tell them I was listening to their conversation, they're going to hate me. But the truth is, in my experience, 90 percent of the time, they're just excited that somebody cared. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're mm-hmm. excited that somebody wants to talk about what it is that they're talking about. And then I that energized me. I really loved that. And that's when I started doing the Uber and the Lyft thing, because one, I wasn't drinking at all uh but i didn't want to go to bed and two like it, it, it's like this freeing thing you know this this situation where for 10 to 20 minutes maybe longer i have a complete stranger in my car who i'm just going to talk to if they want to talk mm-hmm. and they never have to see me again and it showed me just how like the percentage of people who just want to talk to somebody like in person 
and not over a keyboard is is I would I would put it at ninety five percent at least. Yeah, I bet. Yep. But there's one other thing that I want to say while I thinking about it. I also I w- I'm a child of the internet. I grew up on the internet. I made a lot of friends around the world. And there were when I was younger, there were all these different platforms. Like there were different video gaming platforms and there were different chat app apps and like back when all... people called them platforms. Right. Exactly right. Like the, I remember M player and then that turned into Game Spy. And like yeah. So I met a lot of people on these things and uh like MSN Messenger and AIM Messenger and okay, like, like yeah. all these so I, I like have friends I have a friend in Sweden who I talk to regularly. I have some friends from England. Yeah, when like, I, I talked to this guy who I played but, video games with and practiced guitar with via the internet for like 10 years. He lives in Dover, Delaware. I never met him a day right. in my life, but he was like one right. of my best friends in high school. So, wow. so one of the things that keeps me on Facebook is it's the only thing we all have anymore. You know, it's mm. the only way that I can talk to them. I, like I could try to convince them, well, get WhatsApp or get this. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, but even I'm not going to open that up, you know? Mm-hmm. And it it sort of locks you in Isn't in a that way. Interesting too, how how easy how easy things have become, and like how how uh, high the bar is for us to like put time into it. Like I fi- I run into this a lot with like um, money exchanging apps. Like I I use Google Pay, and everybody tells me to use Cash App. I will never use Cash App. I don't even know what those are. I just have a Venmo. And and that's that's the other one. I will never use Venmo. And the, isn't that so weird? Because it's as simple as downloading. It's you, oh, you just. I thought it was like a philosophical corporate America no. thing. You're just too lazy. It, that's and that's the thing. Like people are so like. And I don't. I, I don't know if it's. If, it might be a combination thereof. But okay. it, it's so weird how how like how high the bar has gotten for like what I'm willing to put time yeah, into doing. It's so. Tr- yeah. oh, I can't set up a Twitter account. Come on. <laughs> Like yeah. that's a big deal. Then I'm gonna have to post and read stuff on oh, there, and I'm gonna have to true. get like I'm gonna have to spend five seconds figuring out how the app works. This is just too much work. Yeah, I gotta. <laughs> I'm just too busy a person. I gotta. I, I I'm should, that important. I really gotta get rid of all of it, man. <laughs> like I enjoy putting pictures on Instagram. I just don't know why I enjoy it. There is an aspect of what you do for a living that it, that it's it's a little more necessary right i have to have something instagram i can't get rid of because that's that's like the main the main right. vein of um sending out our stuff because right. i don't do facebook anymore i right. don't think honestly i don't think we even need a facebook page for the business i don't either there's I, no engagement zero the only thing i will say about facebook beyond what we've already said is events are helpful uh, I have my Google Calendar synced with my Facebook Calendar, so just being invited, yeah, that's to true. an event. So like, I know when the shows are based on who I follow on Facebook because they anybody who creates an event on Facebook, it automatically gets in my calendar whether I acknowledge it or not. Oh, really? Yeah, I should probably do that. Which I kind of like because I get pissy a lot when I miss concerts. And stuff. <laughs> right. Like, right. why doesn't anybody invite me to shit? <laughs> I invite you. I'll invite you. You do. You're I'm always sorry. Invited. I'm sorry. I didn't go to the the. Uh, uh, honey slider one. Oh, dude, that's fine. Dan came Vince, over. Vince came, but he Irish I goodbye to us. I <laughs> just left. Like, I it's ended been up a long night. pretty late just, that night. Yeah, I ended up, we went to Susie's after. It's the best kind of goodbye. Night. The Irish goodbye. <laughs> yeah, Dan Dan DeKalb stopped by. Oh, nice. He Kramered. How's he doing? He's good. He's what is good. A, what is a Kramer? It's where you, 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 you well, he wasn't it. unannounced. He texted us. He's like, "What are you boys doing tonight?" We're like, "Nothing." He's like, "I'll be over at 8 because <laughs> that's, uh, awesome. that's cause, Kramer. Because Jimmy's out of town. No, we um. <laughs> so yes, that's exactly yeah, that's, why. Yeah. Um. So we have a buddy. We have another buddy named Jimmy who lives just down the street from us. Um. We're gonna give him a key to our apartment, and when Jimmy uh, Woodle moves into Troy, we're gonna give him a key to our apartment because we desperately want people to just show up unannounced. Can I have a key? That's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. That's have incredible. <laughs> we want people to just show up unannounced and hang out with us. Isn't it weird? You know, one of the funny things, one of the, one of the funny like revelations I had when when I talked to Jim and Matt about starting this podcast was like, people people want to just hang out in person so bad and have people a part of their regular life so bad mm-hmm. that we really isn't it funny that we we like we scheduled our time, <laughs> we scheduled a pop piece of our week to go like let's just put everything else down. And we're just gonna get in a room together and hang out. This is too mm-hmm. perfect. This is too perfect. Not even. A- we're not gonna watch football. We're not gonna order pizza. We're just gonna talk. Mm-hmm. I was at a birthday party, a three-person birthday party with family earlier, and I said, "Okay, I gotta go." 
And they were like, where are you going? And I was like, I'm going to go home and talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, what? It's like, yeah, I'm going to talk for a couple hours. Who does that anymore? And, <laughs> and they're like, what does that mean? And I was like, I mean, we're just going to talk about what? Huh? Whatever comes up, I guess. And they're like, what? Who does that? Just mm. like post about it. Yeah, and you know, the funny thing is like I, a couple times I like I tried to liken it to like a Bible study. Or like, or it's like, are we all just like guys that need group therapy? And then I just realized, like, no, this is what this is what technology has done to us. Mm-hmm. Like, this well, is a valuable experience. This is more valuable than anything I can do on the internet. What else am I gonna? This you guys is, care if I finish this? No, go I'll for kill it. Kill it. You own it. I this is it. actually an interesting thing. Do you think we're doing this just for the virtue that we can share it? That's, no, well, because we've gotten together a few times. We got together twice before we started recording it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the fact that, that we could share it and potentially like have an audience, it makes it exciting. Right. Because, I mean, what we're it, doing right now is just what human beings used to do yeah. before we were cyborgs. I, I, I want to make a, a sort of religious parallel here. Oh, good. So I know that you're, you're not religious, but you're like open to interpretations of things. I feel this is a this is a funny thing because I feel like no matter what you say, if you're if you don't ascribe to a certain religion, you sound douchey. But like my favorite is like I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. <laughs> That's my favorite one. I mean, it's accurate because mm-hmm. like I mean, I believe there is a certain kind of there's a certain spirit to things. Uh, there's uh, some kind of supernatural element at work, whether it be a scientific element or not. But I don't think organized religion is a good thing. Fair. I've made the argument that everyone's religious I, and I stand by, I, I will stand by that. I haven't had anybody convince me otherwise, but mm-hmm. uh, to make the the religious analog in the past, you would do things you needed to do before God. Yeah. Right. So we don't have like, we live, we live in a post God world in a lot of ways. We live it. We live in Nietzsche's, you know, yeah. God is dead. Yeah. What was it? And what but, was, it? What well, was well, the, there's well, a video if, on YouTube. That what I'll if, have to show it to you sometime. What if the God today an image of hum, everybody, like, like what we're doing, like we, we record this, we put it online mm-hmm. to God, the gods of the internet. Maybe they'll like my <laughs> offering. Well, like yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe they'll like it. And, and like, and, and I will be bestowed with wonderful things. I, I don't, I don't see it as much different. It's, I mean, I, I just think we just live in a world where when we see society, a is giant gone. light in the sky come up every day, we understand why. Mm-hmm. And they didn't, you know, like yeah. if you, if you, if you live in a world where you, you don't understand why anything is happening. Well, and the <laughs> funny, the funny thing, like we don't understand why anything is happening. No, we just think we we do. We, we understand more about the physical world mm-hmm. and and why the solar system exists. But you know, once you try to, you know, tackle like, why do humans have consciousness? <laughs> why are we sentient and other animals aren't? What happens after our life ends? Is the sentience continue? It's like you still kind of have to. You have to have totally non-scientific rationale for those for answering those questions which yeah. which now people are are called god any any kind of emotion that you can't can't describe to other people you you go as you say it's a spiritual experience which i think is why when people start experimenting with like psychedelic drugs it's like that's you know it's like i know i know that the dots, you know earth spins around and it goes around the sun but like i can't tell you i, I don't have like a language for describing <laughs> things i did shouldn't have done in college <laughs> that's a really good point i don't have a language for why i keep doing a bunch of shit i know is terrible for yeah me. stuff like but that yeah i don't i don't know why i just know i keep doing it and i know i'm gonna keep doing it but that tends to lend itself to spiritual discussions these days i think yeah there's there's a that's another thing that i think people are starved for whether they are aware of it or not and i think they they don't like the language they don't like the the words that are used. Oh yeah, but everybody wants what what you could call a religious experience. Well, part of the you other know, er, everybody wants everybody wants a priest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the but, other, but, but, but a modern priest. One of they the want... other downsides of living in modern age era, and this is really, and I'm just kind of like just dawning on this now, right? It's not only that we do we have a lot of technology that's changing our lives, but we have such a high resolution of history right now. Like we can look at the at the the history of organized religion and looked at how it messed up the past so hard and they can make us really not a fan of, of religion and by extension 
any concept of God whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But even though, but even though in reality there's a biological need to talk about it or wonder about it I or think come that's up with shifting. a philosophy. I think I think what like you said, like it's it's social media or society is now our God. I think that's true, and I th- I think people have that need for a religious experience or a spiritual experience. It's just they want someone who is endowed with just this credibility to tell them that what they're doing is okay. Mm. Mm-hmm. Nobody, that's what everybody nobody wants. has that credibility. But the thing, but the thing is, it's it's the same old thing. It's like power lies where where you see it lies. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's all perception. Wherever you perceive power to lie is where power is. And I think society and social media has that power right now, and so people mm-hmm. worship it. And it's just it's strange because it's muddled because you're worshiping society, but you're worship you're really worshiping yourself. And you're just putting all these things out there for people to like and click and stuff. And that's that's God telling you, it's like, yeah, what you're doing is okay. Oh, shit. That's true. That's what it is. That's why I argue everyone's I think, religious. Because I, I, I don't, th- I agree with you. I don't think that, I don't think that human beings on a large scale can be any other way. Like, yeah. we all have to, we have to worship something. And, and we, if we, if we. If we think we're not worshiping worshiping something, we're dangerous. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly think that. Like, if you think you don't worship something, you're who I'm scared of, because that means you think you have access to the truth. You know, you think that your religion or your way of understanding the way everything is is the right way. And I would say, my opinion is, no one has the right way. You're a flawed human. That's my religious. My religious. If I have one religious law that i believe beyond anything is no one is god well that's that's the crux of it nobody like 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 we were just saying nobody knows what they're doing nobody knows why we're here like what we're supposed to be doing and that's why there's this need for this perceived credible entity to tell you that what you're doing is fine because you don't know it's true and it's just i think it just shifts where like where that where that lies That's oddly why people like oddly it's, it's 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 like people who are willing to admit that that people will look to the most on anyone else who's willing to to disseminate that knowledge or like be vulnerable enough to go that like most people are just looking for some kind of leader which i think is why people we be, there's been a huge explosion in talking heads on youtube right now or podcast culture mm-hmm. has just mm-hmm. taken off recently mm-hmm. it's because a lot of the times like these these people aren't like brilliant philosophers right they're not econo- they're not economists they're, they don't have phd's from like private universities they're dudes who just like told jokes for a living and had an mma career it's joe like, rogan yeah yeah that's but, he's he's but, but the he is so daddy of it he is so uh, willing to say stuff like that right say mm-hmm. like i don't really know what i'm doing i'm just kind of getting up here and I'm, i enjoy talking and hearing what other people have to say and hearing people who are way more important than me talk about their personal life philosophy mm-hmm. because we assume we assume that we've spent so much time worshiping those people in the public eye they're big parts of media they get lots of attention and then you hear them talk and they realize like oh yeah i don't i don't have a thing in my life figured out 90 percent of my life was depressed and you go like whoa that sounds like me and <laughs> and then you go, and, then, and then it kind of inspires you to go like well if all of these other people who are really successful are just people why do that why don't i deserve success and that's and that's that's what's really interesting about it is I think a lot of people are really capable of doing all these things like Joe like again Joe like you said Joe Rogan isn't like he's not like now he is but he wasn't an extraordinary human being dude no. the dude hosted Fear Factor <laughs> you know but now he's like he's like people look to him as like this philosophical and social uh, compass that's wild. Mm-hmm. And I mean, to be honest, I mean, like now, right, again, like he's accumulated probably a good deal of experience that's a little bit, like he's talked to people like Jordan Peterson and Bill Burr and the, all these physicists and, and Musk and, and all these like really... Alex and, Jones. And Alex Jones. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> and people, and Alex Jones and, and, he's, and, and, and the CEO of Twitter, right? Like he's just had, he's had the opportunity to talk with so many people at this point that his 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 input almost is valuable Mm -hmm. there's something else about joe rogan because i've been trying to get my dad to to like to like i try i i I like talking to my dad he's like the only person in my family who likes who likes that i like to talk about stuff you know Mm -hmm. everybody else is kind of like shut up like this Uh, it's no criticism it's just who they are but so my but i've i've tried to get him like 
because I talk too fast and I talk from my perspective and I told him to watch Joe Rogan and he agrees that like one thing that's really nice about Joe is because he comes from a spot of being uninformed, even if he is informed, he makes it accessible to people who aren't paying attention. Mm -hmm. So like I'm the type of person who I listen to a ton of podcasts. I'm a very internet person. I hear things and I can hear coded language. I can hear, you know, I can hear all sorts of things, you know, and maybe a lot of it's in my head, but what, whatever. But someone like my dad, he doesn't understand what I'm talking about when mm -hmm. I say like, this word is a problem. If you hear that, you know, like if, or, or these people aren't what you think they are, you know, like they're not really Democrats or real liberals, you know, like they're extreme leftists and right. he, can, he can't understand what I mean. He can't understand what I'm saying or why I know that based on how they're talking. And Joe Rogan has a really great way of saying, can you explain that in the right moment? Mm -hmm. He says that. I think if you, I feel like if you like data mind every word, every phrase Joe Rogan has said, can you explain that? Because mm -hmm. he's in there. He says that all the time because what he's really doing is saying, I know what you're talking about. But nobody else has a clue what you're talking about. Yeah. See, I, Can I always, you build a case a little bit? Can you I, like because once you once you explain that, they might get a little bit out of what you're about to say. I always assume he doesn't know what he's talking about, and he's just naturally that curious. Because I feel That's like true if, too. if I if I if I had that, I mean, like you know, we've done the podcast a couple of times, and I don't. I mean, maybe there's not too many instances of this, but like we'll usually we'll we'll egg each other on to, to continue. Sure. Yeah. elaborating on themselves if we don't understand what's going on but joe joe is like a very clearly a naturally curious person you know he he obviously likes what he does he likes talking to people and i think he just gets a kick out of like having having the full picture or the full perspective from the, the partner he's having on the show before he comments i think he started that way but i think w what he understands now well, you're right it, yeah like he the reach he has he, he, I think he feels the weight of the responsibility of the situation he's in very fully. He understands more people watch me than the news. I like, think he's. I think he's recently come. He's recently coming mm -hmm. into that yeah. that understanding. I don't think he. I don't. For a long time, I don't think he understood. Honestly, right. I think the Elon Musk interview is what really brought that him was around. A, that to was that a big. Idea. I completely yeah. agree with you yeah. because weirdly enough, it was like. All of the crazy shit that Alex Jones says mm -hmm. coming from a person who knows stuff, you know, not all of it, but, you know, he was saying some stuff that had Alex Jones said it, Joe could have laughed at it. You mm -hmm. know, anybody could have laughed at it. But Elon Musk is like he is demonstrably a genius. Right. And everybody you knows that. Yet you can't even people who hate him. You I can you can't avoid the fact that he's a genius. He has accomplished more in his life than anyone. Mm -hmm. I, 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 that I can think of. I don't know anybody alive today who's accomplished as much as that guy has. He's, I want to, I want to get more into Elon Musk in a, in a minute here. Cause he's like, I think he's a certain kind of human that only comes around once in like a century. Yeah. And I think there's several iterations of that in history, but, um, mm -hmm. the, the Alex Jones point, and it kind of relates, like, I think I don't, it's going to come off like I'm defending Alex Jones, but I, did you, did you listen to the recent? I loved it. I think, I thought yeah. it was highly entertaining. The first 40 minutes where he was like, he was like fighting with Alex Jones to, he's like, explain yourself, explain yourself, explain yourself. Like tell people why you did this. Tell people what you really think of this topic. Like he was reluctant to do that. But I, I honestly, I believed him when he said, he's like, I didn't realize what I was doing. Like I didn't realize the people I, that listened to me. And I, I think Joe is the same way. I think Joe could easily have gotten himself and still can get himself into hot water just because of the influence he has. Like you and I, like I can say something pretty fucked up right now. And like it would it would probably put me in a pretty bad position in Troy, but nowhere else that you have to multiply that by like right. 15 stops. Right. And that's where Alex Jones was. But he thought he didn't know he was there. And to, as far as as far as what I got from what he was saying, if he was being honest, I, and it's interesting because Joe Rogan could easily get himself into trouble, which he won't because he's he's an intelligent human being. And I don't know that Alex Jones is extremely intelligent. I completely agree with you, and I think that's why they had their little beef. Mm -hmm. Like there was this little bit where Joe 
Rogan maybe wasn't sure how to have be friends with Alex Jones and handle the responsibility when he wasn't confident that Mm -hmm. Alex Jones was handling the responsibility of the situation he was in. Um, There's a lot that you said that I agree with. It's the technology happens is happening so fast that no one at the top of it can understand real time what effect they have. Mm-hmm. They can only understand what effect they had yesterday, which is terrifying. That's right now. That's really scary thought to think about. It's it's that fast. Like yeah. I want. I, I, I can wanna... never actually be confident that I know my place in this because it's changing that fast. Mm-hmm. That's that's terrifying i want to jump in and, and talk change the subjects a little bit here because um i want to talk about mark zuckerberg for a little while please do um a couple days ago facebook made a press release saying that they were going to completely change the model of facebook and you know starting in i don't know probably like a month or two they're going to just roll out this idea about facebook 2.0 and I mean, I could probably pull up if I had my phone or they're something. Gonna, I could can get, I ask a question They're going to make it more private, go. right? Yes. Yeah. The, the goal is to make it more private. And this is an initiative started by Zuckerberg. And the point is um, Facebook, I mean, he, he's just kind of like realized now that you know he's, he's kind of like people have had the discussion for long enough that Facebook is dead, that he's fully aware of it. And he knows that if Facebook is going to continue as an entity, too many too many people are concerned about their privacy is one Mm -hmm. that seems to be the biggest deal at least to him and in his eyes certainly he's like nobody's going to continue to use social media anymore if people think that they're being spied on or if they think that elections are going to be tampered with or if they think it's going to destroy their interpersonal relationships so we have to start focusing on changing the platform so that it strengthens interpersonal relationships i'm subscribed to this like newsletter called morning brew and they kind of take the news and compile it and send it out via email in a way that like millennials can read it. And uh, um, they made a good point. They said, um, you know, uh, it seems to be like, you know, Facebook is trending towards more private conversations anyway. You know, don't believe us. Check, you know, like Q, Q your 10, like group, group chats in mm-hmm. messenger and ask them. Right. And it, those, those are more popular now than, than being on oh, the wall, the, the wall, you know, it, which is basically someone described it as, um, it's the town square social media. Nobody likes that anymore. No. Nobody wants to have all of their information out there all at once. That and it's trash. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just full of ads. It's, it's just like full a, of spam. Like look at a community bulletin board. It's trash. Yeah. It's trash. <laughs> it's exactly <laughs> what There's it is. There's nothing useful there. It is. Oh my God. It's just a bunch of noise. You can't actually yeah. get anything. But I, I, think that's, I think that's cool. Like, and I, You see the beginnings of it like on Instagram because Facebook owns Instagram. The close friends stories. I like that feature. I heard it's about cool. that. I like that feature. And that's why it's going that way because people want that. You know, one of the like, geniuses. I want to be myself, but then I want to lose like the majority of my followers that don't fucking know who I am. And so like, I'll just send this to my close friends. And that's and I think that's cool. And I think that's the way it's going to go. One of the you geniuses funny, of that though, is I, you don't I, know if you're someone's close friends and you feel fucking cool. Like oh, when when you see got, like that green a, thing around it, like I'm fucking close. Friends. I got a close friend story from Girl Blue. And I was That's, like, you yeah, know what? same. And I was like, I I feel so cool right you now. You know what's <laughs> fucked up about that though, is that that's gonna get commodified to some extent later on down the line. Can you pay to become close? Well, friends? not only not only that, but it's just like it's it's just gonna become as as regular as as any other form of social media was. Mm-hmm. Just like Snapchat stories, yes. just like when Instagram was brand new, it's like, oh, I've got this girl's Instagram. You just gotta, you gotta enjoy it while it's here. And while it's, while Eventually, it's new. I mean, the, all yeah. the thing about like all of these like signifiers on social media that 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 make up like superficial status, it's like they do until they don't anymore, and then they're then they're the new regular, mm-hmm. and then it's like because the, because there's always gonna be there's gonna be some asshole that like makes every person on their story a close friend, because that's. That's just like it's toxic, but people are That's drawn to it, and then true. everyone's and nobody's going to use the old feature, and you're going to have to have some new mechanism come in to mm-hmm. make people feel closer than they really are via the internet. I think this. I think it's really commodifying something that already exists, and this is a tidbit that I learned from my 13 year old niece. What the kids are doing is the kids they have a, on Instagram, they'll have a public Instagram. And they'll have a private Instagram. A fin stuff. Yeah, they're a fin, fin stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah. And That's so, smart. and so, if you're if you're cool enough, you can get my finsta. And I that's that's what they're doing. They're just commodifying that. It and, even sounds cool. And I can ruin it right now, like Patreon. It's like, give me a hundred bucks, I'll give you my close friends' stories. 
there it is. That's and that's that's where it's gonna go. But you just have to enjoy it while it's pure, just like Facebook was once a pure absolutely gonna form happen. of something. But and the, the what's what's scary about it is like like you said, these things are moving very very fast, very very fast. And I mean like it's that simple. Like a, like some kid was just like, ah, I need to have a private Instagram for <laughs> for me and my boys. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine if what what if like some random celebrity you f- happen to follow on Instagram just you got a close friend's notification from them? It'd be weird. It'd be weird. I mean, I, I it'd be weird for like one second, and then it'd be like they made everybody close friends. Mm-hmm. I have one blue what? check who follows me. Really? Who yeah, is it? They're not that big. You wouldn't right. know. Who I'll it ask is. you later. Yeah, you would. You won't know who it is. It's so just are it's a like, musician I met. But oh, I was gonna say they're like film people. No, 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 no. I wish. I met a guy. I, I was bummed I didn't get his number I was on an airplane to Edinburgh. Uh, I was going to sleep the whole time because it was an overnight flight, but I was sitting next to this guy, and he seemed cool. And I started talking to him. We, we talked the entire flight to the point where the person in front of us was like, I'm trying to sleep. Will you please shut the fuck up? <laughs> and Yeah, but he, uh, we, we were talking. He gave me like... I felt like he gave me this sage wise advice for this trip I was about to begin. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that he is married to this like Disney channel star. Oh really? Yeah. And like, he was like, he he kept asking me to like, give me his number. And I was like, I'll give it to you later. And I just never did it. I don't, I don't know why I didn't do it, but cause you didn't know the fuck he was. No, I did. He told me. Oh, okay. He did. I just like, I was like, "Ah, I don't know. You know, I'll give you my phone number when we leave or something like, I don't know. Who's but, he married to? I don't know. She was in what are the name of those movies? Is it like High School Musical or something? Maybe oh. maybe one of the High School Musical. Oh movies. really? Movies. Yeah. I don't remember. To be honest, That's I don't. My know. period of time, or maybe something else. I don't know. I don't know. I don't watch that stuff. No, I didn't. <laughs> wa- I wasn't a big. It's, honestly, I, I actually uh, sent her a message when she never read it. I sent her a message on Instagram like, so this is really weird. But I had an amazing conversation with your husband, and I would like to talk to him again. <laughs> she never looked at it I bet if she, she ever does I'll be so embarrassed her publicist <laughs> or her social media person is like fuck this she's like I haven't heard that one before fuck <laughs> this guy that's exactly um, no that's that you bring up an interesting topic though and this is gonna be a, I think this is gonna be a real hard hitter Nick and I just watched a video the other day on YouTube and it's uh it was this guy talking about Disney Channel original movies were, the, were you guys old enough for those oh yeah Bear I loved Underwrapped or whatever. yeah you might you must have missed them I wasn't paying attention. Do you remember Under Wraps? I was part of the SpongeBob. That's generation. one of my favorite ones. I loved that movie. I it was loved a great it. movie. That's it, funny. It had you said Dauber that. from because I I told I told Nick it. I was like my two favorites are probably Brink and Under Wraps. Oh, Brink was a ama- Brink was like the the trendsetter. Brink was the original. Brink was the shit, man. Yeah, I loved. I Brink. still I always think about that last race scene whenever I'm going off like the Troy exit because I'm like take the inside turn. What happened to that actor? I don't fucking know. He he was cool. He, he probably like, sexually assaulted somebody. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost, almost definitely. He that or he got into somebody. cocaine. A little too heavy. Will you? This is my laptop's gonna die. There's a. Oh, oh. It's all, it's all right. It's plugged into the. Mm, technical difficulty. Yeah. There's Headphones a, off. Leaned over the table. <laughs> I don't see it. I don't see an <laughs> outlet on here. All right. Uh, well. Yeah. Um, no, High School Musical is when Disney Channel original movies or DCOMs as they're called died. I mean, I I believe that. Yeah, they were, they were pretty terrible. I'm not gonna add a testimony to that. I'm just Zac Efron. Zac Efron killed the DCOM. <sighs> Murdered it. Bloody. He's gonna be uh, Ted Bundy in the movie. I want to watch. Really? That. Yeah. He's playing Ted Bundy in they're a film. Yeah, they're going to make him to buddy. Uh, is he on Netflix? Oh, maybe. There is a sick Netflix movie coming out that I'm really excited about. It's called uh, Triple Frontier. Yeah. This might convince me to get Netflix again. It's got um it looks it's it I mean, it could it could very well be terrible, but it looks pretty good and it's got an 8.8 on uh, IMDb. You know, I I oh shit. Yeah. I might have to You know what's what's killing me is like for the longest time I had a hard time getting into Netflix. Really? Cuz I was never I was never like a TV. I was like a music nerd, I should point out, like <laughs> in high school. I wanted to talk about this too, but I, I don't know if we'll have time to tonight, but like I'm kind of realizing I had this discussion with a couple with really with my roommates last night. The first time I had like a fun discussion with my roommates. My me me and a colleague uh, hung out he came over and, and 
we smoked for a little while and just talked about economics and my roommates walked in and we all hung out <laughs> and I, and I went, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun stuff. Um, that's dope. Though. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they, they all, they, they sat down and, and we ordered some like cheesecake. I don't know, whatever. Just, I just realized how uncultured I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we smoked some weed. We talked about economics, and we ordered yeah. cheesecake. Yeah, just talking just about, talking you know what about we did the other trade night? deal that happened the other day. I drank an entire Colt Forty Five by myself <laughs> and played video games the other night. That's cool too. Well, what you, video game did you? You play? do you, man. Uh, I mean, well, I mean, uh, I, I want I want him to finish this story. I, yeah, yeah. I was trying to make a funny. <laughs> um, so anyway, my my friends came over and we talked for a little while about. I'm not sure, entirely sure where I was going with this. What was it? What did I say before this? I you said you wanted to talk about this. Oh shit, that's not good. You were smoking, talking about economics. Uh, there was something right before that. I was like, my roommates came in and I talked to them about. Oh yeah, like how I think I went to an experimental high school because I I tried to tell them I was like I grew up really poor and then my my they were trying to say like oh yeah well describe your worst like you know crackhead story or this girl dropping out of school is like no guys you don't get it i went to school with 50 kids it was designed it was in an office building all right we didn't have a gym we didn't have a cafeteria like we didn't have enough money to buy food for cafeteria for like like you know school lunches the same way the other schools in the district could afford to it was 50 kids when i went there there was only the freshman class which was me and the sophomore class above me and they had 50 kids. So it was like 100 kids when it started. But it was 50 kids class. They couldn't just speed yeah. on you to make you a sophomore? <laughs> I almost, it almost happened that way. I mean, I, I like took like a physics class, high school physics class my freshman year. There is a... There is a I didn't a, do very well in it, but... That's just strange. Like stereotype of poor. You know, like... The, you're a different kind of poor than what the right well it's a, well, a lot of the times when I try to explain to people like where my background, I go like, oh, I, just, I went to high school in the ghetto. And then people... But people have a thought about what that is, mm-hmm. and that's not. He does it still doesn't come close to what I went through. It's right. like because I went to like a poor high school, but it was also it was so small that it's not exactly like there was gang violence. There was just like so much underperformance and underfunding that it was like I had a lot of classes. Like four kids would show up. There's a th- roster of thirty kids, and most kids just wouldn't show up. And because it was a new project, and the 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 city. Um, city government came up with a budget to they, they came up with a budget of $30 million to renovate a new high school like a three story historical landmark that was going to cost millions and millions of dollars to renovate they were going to put these new vocational programs in here and, and they said okay we're going to get kids in the city school district out of the city and into college or into like real careers mm-hmm. and that was in 2007 and then the 2008 recession happened all oh. that money went away but they had two classes that had already signed up to go into this high school and I was one of one of the 100 kids that had signed up to go to it. So they said, well, wow. we, we have these 100 kids. We don't know what to do with them. And they just put us in a two-story office building next to the building they were going to renovate. Again, like no no facilities whatsoever. But the but and, and, and they had all these dreams to get like pass rates, you know, that were reasonable for once. And it was just like a 50% pass rate like every other city school. And I was like one of maybe a half dozen kids who had a GPA over a 90 Wow. Yeah. So the reason I wanted to bring that up is like, you know, in terms of like personal like experience, when people bring up things like, oh, do you remember High School Musical? Or do you remember, you know, do you remember that hit song from like 2009? I go like, no, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> right. I don't get it I at all. It. I have no idea what you're yeah, talking no, about. There was like no like social. Yeah. That's interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. That's always... ca- makes me feel privileged as fuck you know like i like, hate doing that too because no, 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 i don't fine. there's I, definitely the, the, there's yeah. like something about like a lot of people always it's natural for people to want to come up with a narrative of like my childhood was hard no it's just like you don't different. you don't realize mm. you don't right don't realize the things you take for granted it's a good thing actually yeah. To, yeah. to be to be aware of like i i take a lot for granted for sure i'm pretty aware of how how much i sucked as a kid <laughs> <laughs> i mean i definitely sucked I grew up. I was I, annoying as fuck. But I grew up like I would say probably middle class. My mom worked very hard. She went to school right. Like she graduated from her graduate like grad school after oh. I graduated from high, from high school. Okay. And so like they put a lot of work into like getting us like a a good childhood and stuff. And I just didn't appreciate that shit at all. Mm-hmm. I didn't try in school. Yeah, I was it's, terrible. It's fair. And I I'm very honest about that. And I know that about myself. And mm-hmm. I. 
I make a, I make a good point to like mention that when I can. <laughs> I think it's a good thing. I was a terrible person. And I've, <laughs> I've we, grown up. We all are. We, you don't know what you're taking for granted when it's normal. Yeah. You know, when your your normal doesn't seem like you're taking anything for granted. Well, one of the one of the one of the side effects of that too for me growing up was that like you know I didn't I didn't necessarily want to make friends with people in my school. Mm-hmm. It was like. You know, I I was over ambitious. I was one of the only kids that would like raise my hand at like math class or history class or what have you. The point that like so it started to bother some other kids because they just couldn't keep up. But like it, the school was not challenging to me at all because it was just it was so underfunded. There was like a large number of students who could but, not pay attention, and I don't you know I don't blame them. I feel bad for them more than I am angry at them because a lot of these kids just like didn't have parents or were like moving from home to home or were like more destitute than i was i mean but I, I, that was the kind of like high school that i went to but pr- weirdly i i could go on facebook right and i could see like people who who like lived in gated communities and i could see like the sports teams they were on i could see like who they were dating i could see how many friends they had and mm-hmm. all of a sudden all of that started to make an impression on me i went like why am i not like that oh, shit. and i didn't understand that it, there were like environmental circumstances like preventing me from having like a stereotypical high school musical childhood. So weird. So you guys didn't, yeah, you guys didn't have any sports teams. We didn't have, we didn't have a prom. We didn't have. There wasn't any track. school identity at all. No, it was just like I'm going to school. I the point of me of this is to get good grades to get into a college. Well, that's I mean that's which that it, was, which that it, was probably good. For it you. probably was, but it, then I got to college and I couldn't make friends because I went to like a huge party school, mm, right. and all these people had like a very different understanding of what the purpose of education was. Yeah. Or all and. It, it was it was just like impossible for me to handle. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Where'd I don't, you go to I college? Don't wanna... I went to Syracuse University. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to minimize any of what you said, but there's something know. in there that uh, latches I mean, on to me. But I, I felt mm-hmm. similar, but from a completely different perspective. Right. You know, I didn't experience what you did. I did not. I did not have a high school with no no football team. Right. But I did feel all through high school that it was like the hell is this like yeah it's like, it just I was feels like, very fake i just felt like i don't really have to do anything i mean i i could just i could just you know slide through this if i wanted yeah. to mm-hmm. and then college i honestly felt the same i, I was confused mm-hmm. a little bit too because right. in my mind i thought college is where they keep telling me you're gonna go and it's gonna get hard like right. it's gonna get and i didn't find undergrad to be all that hard to be mm-hmm. honest unless i decided to find things that were going to be exceptionally difficult right and I, I kind of wanted that whole thing with like, look to your left, look to your right. One of these people won't be here. You know, like I kind of wanted that to be the reality. Yeah, you wanted like, that like, movie it, scene. I it wasn't that. like that I, for you. It wasn't like that. It uh-huh. was more, like, I felt more like if enough people complain that this is hard then then they'll change it. And we know that. Mm, yeah. <laughs> like there, it, it just felt a little bit, not everywhere, you know, in in my I took I was I went to school for computer science and I really liked this one professor who I gave a really hard time, but he was really hard. Like his classes were all extremely hard, and that's why I took every literally every class he taught. Where'd you go to school? Siena. Okay. Um, yeah, they they fired him, <laughs> but <laughs> or they, he he didn't get uh he didn't get tenured. You're right. taking this a little too seriously, man. <laughs> yeah, right. But I took every class he he. I gave him a really hard time the whole way through of it, but I loved it. I, that's hard for me to even imagine to not have like, even I, I was never really big on school spirit or anything, but Uh you know, I had friends. I had, I was in a weird, my, my grade, my class was very clicky. And so I was in a very, yeah, that was another thing that I was blew my, like, I don't know what clicks are. I do, (laughs) but I was in a group that was the weird. It was like the weird, no, not click group. It's because, uh, like one of them played football, right? Uh, one of and dated cheerleaders. One of them was on the debate team. One of them was a super math nerd. Mm-hmm. One of them was uh, another one played football. Another, you know, like like right. it was such a weird breakfast sort of, club, They're right? Friends, it was yeah. it was like a breakfast club group of friends, and it was great because for me, I got to go, I got to go everywhere. Like I got to. I got invite. I got to sit at the table with the cheerleaders if I wanted to, yeah. or the freaks if I wanted to. Yeah, and it was amazing. I got invited I to mean, everything. I feel. I feel like I kind of understand that, but only because like, the, the when I was where I was going to high school, it's like when you when you go to the same high school for four years with the same fifty or sixty people in your grade. Hmm. At the end of at the end of the first year, you're gonna know all of them. 
just mm. all of them and it's like you you might have favorites in the group but it's like there's you're really not off limits from talking to anyone because everybody knows everyone else in a way that's more that's more tied to the way things naturally are in human cultures probably right you know, like i mean it's very strange that we're in we're in we're alive in a time where we're part of communities that are millions of people yeah that's a weird thing like we can't actually be part of you don't know these people it's much more i don't i don't want to use the word natural but natural to be in communities where you know pretty much everyone or you yeah. at least know of everyone well it's, it's more historically it's more biologically in sync with what we have had to deal with throughout humanity for the past 10,000 years yeah yeah we, you know 150 people maybe All right the, you know, you know right. their personality you know their facade you know everything about them hmm. i want to ask a question before we move on from this i mean wait, wait, uh, you mentioned 2008, the financial crisis. Yeah. What? How old were you? That was, uh, that was, I went into high school in August of 2008. Okay. So that's, I understand. <laughs> how old were you? In 2008. So I graduated in 2010. So I was probably uh, 16, 17. Okay. I graduated college in 2007. Oh, oh yeah. You're, <sighs> I got a job. You're Gen X. Right? I got a job that I didn't want. I'm technically a millennial. No, he's a millennial. Like, so I'm, on, I'm, I'm on the cusp. I'm technically you're, like you're an elder oldest. millennial. I'm an elder. I'm one of your elders. Yeah. Elder <laughs> millennial. They're, I, they're a species, you know. But yeah, so I, I graduated college, got into a relationship and got a job and the whole fell apart. Mm -hmm. From my from my oh perspective, my it felt that God. way. It was like, yeah. it's, it feels like if I don't keep this job, I'm not going to be able to pay my student loans and I'll be homeless. Yeah. Like that's yeah. the way it feels. So I was like, well, I guess, you know, this is life suck it up you do the job whether it's what you want to do or not yeah for me it was i didn't understand it at all i didn't understand the impact whatsoever i just because yeah, well, that's where i was yeah because i was in school it's like yeah. i didn't fucking care that makes sense that makes sense yeah it was very real i remember i remember because i lived in scotia and i worked in albany which was a terrible commute and i remember how much i had a little a little uh mazda hatchback and the gas prices just skyrocketed and it was like i don't i just it, i don't know if i should go to work like yeah you know like like should i just just drive to work and sleep there like i don't i don't i don't know what to do because it's like i'm i'm it's costing me 60 dollars to fill up this this small tank of gas hmm. you know and it, it it has serious effects on you whether you're aware of it or not there's a part of you that's like you 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 naturally i don't want to be universal maybe not everyone is this way i would imagine a lot of people would have reacted the way i did which is when things feel out of control you latch on to what's working yes yeah, right so that had an effect on me because i had to come to terms with that at some point i had to come to terms with the fact that the world told me to do something i didn't want to do and i went along with it but also now when i see things becoming super chaotic i can from a very real perspective understand how many people are not going to accept any amount of change mm -hmm. like and, uh, even if they know that that would be better it's like everything's terrible i can't leave what's working to bolster this how old were you when 9 11 occurred i was a junior in high school yeah wow. that see, so you were like you were like woke for that i was a kid I mean, you were a kid, but like you, you could like you, you probably had discussions about it in class. I stayed home from school at least that a day. at least a few I years stayed home from school, And I, I used to I had a TV in my room, a little 13 inch TV with a VCR in it. And uh, or no, maybe it was a maybe it was a DVD player. I don't it doesn't matter. And I was on TV. I was in my bed, my bed. I, I, there's little details. I don't know why they matter, but they popped into my head. My mattress was right on the floor. I didn't have a box spring or a like a bed frame I was laying on the mattress on the floor and the TV was on it was on C-SPAN because it's what the TV always turned on the C-SPAN and sometimes it was just relaxing to have C-SPAN on and I, I was watching C-SPAN just these Congress people and it suddenly cut to New York City and it was a very bizarre it felt surreal mm -hmm. like it felt I was young enough to not really understand how big a deal it was while it was happening but old enough to know that it had to be a huge deal like mm -hmm. i remember thinking it was i remember 
I don't know if I was thinking or hoping that the first one was an accident and simultaneously thinking that doesn't make sense. You know, like one plane hits the air, hits the plane. And part of me was like, it had to be an accident. Like maybe some kind of a flight problem, but also thinking that's not an accident. You don't accidentally hit the one thing yeah. that's that tall yeah, or one of two things that's that tall. And then, uh, yeah, it did have an impact. It absolutely had an impact because. Well, you're at these two like we transition felt, points in your life. Well, you all, you guys don't remember. And the world changes. You don't remember pre nine eleven either. Like yeah. you don't remember pre nine eleven. Barely. Like I do. I do. I do. And this is this. I this is why I had this discussion with my mom, and because I think I think it relates. Um, I was, I was in fourth grade when nine eleven <laughs> happened. Um. And I, I remember it very vividly. I was sitting next to my buddy Jerome, and we were playing with Star Wars action figures under our desk, not paying attention. Isn't which little details which, you remember? Yeah, which became a, a theme for me in life. I didn't pay attention in school. <laughs> and then the the assistant principal comes in, and I'm like, oh, fuck, we're in trouble. Because <laughs> I thought we were just going to get in trouble for playing with the action figures. But she whispered in my teacher, Miss Van Alstyne's ear, Miss Van Alstyne's head hit her desk, and she just started crying. Oh, and we had a... We had a student teacher who was like, okay, um, we're going to read a book. Oh. And so they just brought us all over in the corner. And we read a book, and then they sent us home early. And I'll never forget, my dad was in the kitchen. We had we had a little TV on the on the counter in the kitchen. And I, I, I see what's on the TV and everything, and there's, like, soldiers in New York City. And as a kid, I was like, I didn't realize, I didn't understand, like, how big the world was. Like, right. the, the rest yeah. of the world didn't exist. Yeah. And I said to my dad, I'm like, did that happen here? And my dad was like, yeah, that, that happened here. And like that stuck with me my entire life. But um, that it kind of, it changes the way you grow up because then like the world was completely different because not, not a few years later, we're watching the invasion of Iraq on live television. And it's, it's, it's interesting to think about now because like. It was barely, I mean, it was like, a, it was like a year and a half later. Yeah. It was. And, and then when I was in high school, my sister's um, my sister's boyfriend enlisted in the army, and he was he was there. He deployed. He was in Fallujah. For, wow. For that, it's like, and so it's it, it's kind of been like this thing through my entire life where it just follows you. And Shit. now being in the military, like this conversation, I can't tell you how much this comes up. I cannot tell you. Like whenever you're in like a new place with like a new set of people in the military, this conversation always comes up because most of the people in the military. They joined because nine eleven. I believe that one hundred. I, I totally understand that because mm. I remember I was what 16, 16 years old, and I technically could have driven down there. Mm -hmm. And there was a real part of me that was like, I should go down there. I should go do something. You wanted to do something, but there's also um. I bring up pre nine eleven because, like a month before it happened. I was with a bunch of friends. We went to a Yankee game in the city and we were relatively politically aware for our age. Let's say like we did model Congress and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> there was a helicopter that kept going up and down, clearly watching the game for free. And we kept joking through the whole game that it was, uh, Osama bin Laden. Like, we, like we, we kept making that joke that this is the Taliban. This is, it's totally the Taliban. Hmm. And you see, I never even knew that they were in the news before 9 11. I had never me, heard of that. Yeah, no, me yeah. either. We did. And, but, but the thing that's so contrasting for me in, in, in our mind is the only reason that we were able to make that joke is because the idea that that could ever happen was impossible. Right. right. Like it, it was, was ridiculous. It's ridiculous. That's it's why not it's possible. There are no terrorists here that happen somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Like, and it just had a serious impact. It just, things were shattered and you could also see the adults trying to act like you could you could see this sort of um attempt to to be like everything's gonna be all right mm -hmm. but but also like i don't fucking know that that's true right right you know i don't we, see i i was just like a tiny bit younger than you were mm -hmm. and i didn't quite latch on to that i was like seven maybe six so i was i was really really tiny and and when when adults were acting hysterical Right. I was just at a young enough age where I was like, oh, adults just ask, act hysterical sometimes. Like when my parents get into an argument and they just go like, it's OK, we'll forgive each other and get over it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm just at the at a young enough age. I was at I was young enough at the time where I was like, oh well, this it'll impact me. But you know, whatever. It's like if I keep my head down and my nose to the ground and keep doing school, like it, none of it will matter. But I don't. But like like to me, pre, the pre nine eleven life was like. I think about it more along the lines of of um to me the biggest difference i remember is that like technology was different there was no internet everything like i remember like a vcr player a little bit (laughs) and i remember like the last big enemy that the united states had was excuse me the ussr and i remember like 9 11 happening and like i you know i didn't nobody could explain to me the difference between like iraq and the ussr all I knew is they were kind of like in that same side of the world. Mm-hmm. And I just, I just, but, but, but the one thing that I kind of like latched on to when, when adults talked about the cold war, is they went like, yeah, the cold war is over, but like, is it, <laughs> could it, could it just, could it heat up again or could it freeze again? I guess red is the right word. Mm-hmm. And I just, and in my head, I was just like, oh yeah, this is just like, this is the result of us being in peace for too long. Right. It's just, things can't stay peaceful forever. Mm-hmm. But that, but that was like the most complicated I could get with it. And that's why and I think that I think the war had a lot to do with technology's advance. Because if you look at like I've I was talking to Nick about this the other day, you look at like histograms of like the advancement of technology over like the course of human history, it always like triples or quadruples during times mm-hmm. of war. That's always. So well, we like war today now is like obviously a war that's successful eliminates people on the opposite side Mm -hmm. but it's so hard to lob bullets at the other side now that that a lot of warfare is just economic warfare right right and i would i would say like that that conventional warfare where it's just attrition ended with like before vietnam vietnam was the first war where killing people didn't matter and Mm -hmm. because it was really the first insurgent war it's because when when it's when there's an insurgency it's ideas that you're trying to kill and you can't kill ideas if you try they multiply yeah you can't kill them that way and so that's it's funny because i I it wasn't in vietnam but in in the afghanistan war they came up with what we call coin in the military and that's counterinsurgency and it's the it's like the doctrine of the military now it's how you combat insurgency and it's like winning hearts and minds and it's all bullshit it's all bullshit because that that sorry no, it's it, like marketing um, it's no, like what no. you're good at that's going. why they want you in the military right, right? but yeah. it but that that ignores the culture of the the host country you're in because right. it's like winning hearts like, and minds you know, we like, built schools in iraq but also like you can't it, win. is that you really is that really that helpful no, for having because, iraq be independent right because yeah. we don't know we don't know anything about their culture what like what they value it's like so if there's like a rival tribe or whatever terrorizing this village it's like all right we roll in we take out the taliban the rival tribe and we free these people and they're cool it's like no it's like because when you rolled in you ran over a goat and that's that guy's way of life that's how he makes his money and supports his family and your money doesn't mean anything to him you need to get him another goat and we didn't do that and we didn't understand that and so we were like as we were rolling through iraq which to our detriment was the most successful military campaign in this country's history we were just destroying this country and these people valued these things we were destroying and we were just creating more problems as we rolled through. And so it's like, it was the all same of thing. this at the same time as I was a child, none of this was co- colored with the complexities of like, you know, the United States has a military all over the world, for instance, to like make sure that it's still the international standard for trading oil. You know, like none of that. I, had, I wasn't even a layer yet. Mm hmm. Yeah, which now as an accounting student, I I revisited that topic this weekend with a couple buddies and went like, oh, this is horrifying. <laughs> well, people don't understand that we're an empire. No, mm-hmm. yeah, no, we're not an, at all. We're an unwitting and we're a um, reluctant empire, and there's a reason we're that way because it's like after World War II, we left our military bases in in Europe because Europe is an unstable place. And when we created NATO, we brought stability to it. And like our military bases are there for that purpose Mm -hmm. because we honestly, NATO, NATO is the United States. Everybody (laughs) votes and they're like, yeah, we'll give money to the United States to to intervene. (laughs) That's what it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's, but people don't understand that. And they get all, they get upset about military intervention in in different countries and things like that. But it's like, it's it's kind of just the way things are. It's the way we built we built the world. The Yalta Conference after World War II, we were just carving up Europe and making it the way that the Allies wanted it to be. 
we created Israel. We created a country. Yeah. Yes. A lot of those Middle Eastern countries. Yeah, those we borders created. were decided then. Yep, and it, it's and we're responsible for it now, yeah. and we always will be. And it's the same way with the Middle East. I completely, um, I really want to talk about this because, especially what you said about, you know, what, it's, it's what funny. happened in Iraq. This, this topic doesn't come up very often because we're so privileged that our number one gripe with society is all the time is, oh look at how social media is like, yeah. torn us apart <laughs> interesting. Mm. but uh, we, we we'd never give the rest of the world a second thought i want to respond to what you said about you use a very good real world experience of the goat mm-hmm. you know that's a perfect it's a perfect analog about um we won that war but we lost right because like you said the new war is ideas it's not physical like mm-hmm. physical war is kind of over because no one wants to use the nuke. I, I mean, think about that. Like, if you really want to fight a physical war, you have to trust that the other side's not going to use nukes. And nobody wants to use them because if anybody uses them, the whole thing's gone. Like, the, it's not. Anyway, but and in that's order. A whole, that's a whole other topic. That's why all this, all this stuff with Iran and North Korea exists. Right. Because we only want responsible adults at the table that we know. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's like it's okay that Pakistan you, has nukes because we know them, right? But how do you handle the like you use the the phrase responsible adults? Well, how we, do you who get, we perceive to be responsible right? Exactly. Adults. So like the the guy with the goat, you know how how do you get that guy? How do you get the people of that country to be but you know are from our perspective responsible adults? And this is why I think I I I go back to this all the time. But it's this is the information war to me. It's a war of ideas. It's it's a whole thing and you it is about winning the hearts and minds of people but you don't win them over the way that you don't win them over with advertising mm-hmm. um you have to make people believe that their idea is their own you they have to make and you you do that by sowing seeds of dissent in what the way things are mm-hmm. so the thing the problem with that is we are the easiest target of that in the in the world yeah that's what russia's doing to us right because we're so successful Mm -hmm. we want so we are more addicted to our narrative or to the story that helps us everybody needs a story Mm -hmm. you have to have a culture has to rally around a story in order to be its own society its own nation state it has to have and we're more addicted to it than anybody than anybody i'd argue we've lost sight of our story as i late. i agree and i think it's because russia whoever they knew all we got to do is wait 30 years like start saying a couple things just start putting the seed in there put the seed in there that like maybe maybe this uh maybe this idea isn't all that it's uh, cracked up to be maybe this is maybe this isn't great and that the problem is it's true mm-hmm. like the problem is there's truth in it it actually it, there is no perfect story that's mm-hmm. what i mean by addicted to it yeah. our culture is more addicted to the idea that there is such a thing as a perfect story a mm-hmm. perfect society a perfect right. society we, we, a perfect story ourselves that we had it nailed there's right a, right yeah. and we think that we can have it again and well, the truth is we never had it and we'll never have and it. the only reason we got the fruits of that kind of society is because we lived in a double post-war economy it's we went through two world wars that we both won and we had an economy and it's that, all this is enshrined in in our our founding documents and stuff a more perfect union everything the united states does is in pursuit of a more perfect union not a perfect union a um, more perfect union because it accepts the fact that perfection is impossible exactly. but we're constantly trying to be better Yes. And that's that's really what the story of America is and should be, but we've forgotten that. And there's a I'm not really I'm not this is I mean I'm, I might sound stupid saying this, but I'm not too worried about Russia because there's one thing they're not accounting for, is they're not accounting for the fact that we're comfortable here, and we're always going to be comfortable here. Now, if we hit like a Great Depression size catastrophe, then they might have a, a fighting chance at dividing the United States, but we're comfortable because just like other countries in the world don't want to use nukes. Nobody wants to give up what they got. Well, because it makes you true. makes you wonder though, like how is, is there is there a time limit on how long we're going to be comfortable here? I don't know. I've talked I've talked to a couple people in in finance and economics and people with MBAs you now because that's who I network with, and I go mm-hmm. like, hey, look, be honest with me for a second. Is, is the United States going to be the kind of place I want to live in five years? And people just kind of like nod off. And they don't have a really 
foundational answer for me you know they go and i go like should i find like a little hole in europe to hide and they go like well no don't don't do that you know but and Mm -hmm. then but then i go like okay you know if i had anything other than account an accounting degree would i you know have to not worry about starving they'd go like oh but do you worry that that concern which is valid i'm not minimizing it do you worry that that concern is actually what's going to cause the problem because it's all of it y- yeah you know, all, like, all of the concern is a little bit psychological to some degree whenever like banks fail yeah it's it's more just like the the last guy in line just kind of gives up and goes like you know, <laughs> if someone doesn't step in we're we're screwed um there's def you know but um I, that's but that's the hard part is like i don't know how many other people feel that way and i don't i don't even think the powers that be really know mm-hmm. right like what wait, wait, wait. no so, one's so many ever known people people well i mean just 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 from like a if you wanted to poll everyone and go like what's everyone's faith in the economy right now there's like a word for it in economics it's like um just general consumer what consumer confidence market right? confidence market confidence consumer confidence um you can you can apply that politically it's like how you know what it, what it, would you really think that the united states is going to default for instance stuff like that mm. and you could if, even if you polled everyone, I don't think anyone would have a really good answer because if you look at the last election, all of the all of the political consultants that used data stolen by Facebook and Twitter and social media and stuff, right? They put together a narrative saying Hillary was going to win the election by a landslide, and then she didn't. And then we went, oh, this this information we steal from people via so- social media it's incredibly valuable but it's only it only steals from people on social media and it's not the whole picture mm-hmm. there were a lot of older seniors and such that voted for trump that they didn't not and only a certain demographic is using social, social right, media right exactly in the well, way that they're using it right, to figure that right. stuff out and a lot of that demographic it isn't was, voting yeah, yeah it was it was a classic mistake of uh, assuming that their sample was the population right and it wasn't it, i right. think i to to the point of like whether or not the United States is in trouble. I mean, economically is the only way we're in trouble. I think. Well, because again, again, you're... it's like it makes you. Want, it's like if if once the threat of violence goes away in terms of war, or even if it doesn't totally go away, right? Because we know we know violence can spiral out of control into nuclear warfare. Mm-hmm. So if you want to take another country's power out of control, if you want to knock them out of first place without killing people in your own population or putting your own life in jeopardy right because any literally literally any any person who wants to declare war on someone else has to understand that like two and a half minutes later they could have a a missile launched in their direction Mm -hmm. from nato or the u.s or any any superpower with nukes that could happen in two minutes they would get no warning there would be virtually no really reliable defense because nobody's 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 tested it. Nobody's shot a nuke at another country and then seen it deflected. So nobody knows for sure like how like we we have missile defense systems, right? But we've nobody's mm-hmm. nobody's seen it in the case of a crisis. The United States is pretty prepared. I, I believe you. I believe you. I hundred percent believe you. But my but like, let's say you're Putin or you're um, you're in charge of North Korea or Pakistan or any of these nuclear countries. I mean, nobody, nobody in their right mind would really use want to want to start a physical warfare. No, I mean, and, and even so, so the point being is, is like, but the funny thing is, it's, it's like there are other ways to start war that is just as nefarious. Well, that's um, why some, someone uh, like a, a woman, um, I don't know, in a couple states down, like last year, had had an Android fo- phone, and I learned recently that you know, like a fourth grader could hack an android phone apparently is the joke these days and she got a notification on her phone say a, a, a warning saying that the u.s had just experienced a nuclear strike oh yeah did you see the hawaii thing no oh you, you didn't hear about that no. um there there was a you mean was, the huawei thing no hawaii hawaii okay there was a a state like a state emergency notification system like you know how you like you get those tests on your phone like you're an amber alert or yeah. something Everyone in Hawaii got this alert that there was a new headed for Hawaii. Everyone I did hear about in that. Hawaii. Yes, everybody. Yeah. Yes, it's terrifying. Like and people it, thought it was. Imagine, they were done. imagine but how they easy. Imagine how easy it would be to launch a nuke, right? If you completely dissolved people's confidence, ever read in the news or via text message or anywhere mm-hmm. that that a nuclear missile that struck the United States. Let's let's say we we'd been we got a, a fake jab about that that kind of news like 
five or six times over the course of a year, right? And then a, a nuke drops in Hawaii. And then you get another text message saying that America's at war. And you're like, no way, I don't believe it. And then you see the videos on YouTube and you go like, that's CGI. And then, and then it takes months and months and months for like the actual survivors or family members of people who died in a nuclear strike to go like, no, I swear to God, there was really a nuclear. And mm-hmm. then you go like, no, that can't be possible. The last five or six were all fake. Uh, think- what do you do? I think that's a, that's ex, that's an extreme example, and if it actually happened, you'd fucking know. <laughs> you'd you're know right. pretty quick. You're, you're, yeah, I mean, I guess you're right. You're right, but I mean, my what I was that's what I'm trying to say. The, if if when when the United States sinks into its next war, or when the next the next modern country sinks into its next war, whoever that's going to be first, that that it, it's going to start out as like an economic and code you know programming based warfare Mm -hmm. and i think our biggest problem is china because the biggest issue that the united states has right now outside of global warming which is a global issue is china because china right now is anticipating the the no i think it's 5g is the next thing to come out or is it 6g no it's five yeah they're and china is like building their infrastructure and they're trying to build 5g networks in other countries for cheap like europe and so at post war the united states built all of those all of these things for these countries and that's where like most of our influence comes from is because we pretty much control the information systems of the world but china is positioning themselves to do that now and that's where that's where our, our real threat is and china is very good at that china like china doesn't really get in they were not, they're not going to get into a ground war with a, another superpower they're going to do it through economics and subversion that way the same thing with russia and you're right. Like no one wants to use the nuke, so they're using these subversive tactics to try and get the upper hand. Yeah. And unfortunately, the United States is sleeping on these things because right now we have an idiot <laughs> who doesn't under who probably doesn't understand what he's like how to use most well, things. But well, the worst part of it too is like, regardless of who's you know president or who's in charge, the United States is is not doing what it needs to do to raise citizens that are conscious of this stuff Mm -hmm. we don't have an education system that values stem careers and computer science and economics we just we don't it's it's become too easy to be comfortable in this country that people don't really want to learn and think hard enough that they start to think on a global scale and the big and the other big detriment to the united states is as as fucked up as we think our country is we do have a certain morality um like standard Mm -hmm. china doesn't (laughs) they don't they they will sacrifice their own citizens for the larger goal. They'll do that. And they have done that. They're doing it now. And Russia does not have that morality center. And so we're playing, we're playing by a certain set of rules that our opponents aren't playing. I mean, there is a lot of socialists in the U S that would say that the United States is, you know, a lot of people live in poverty for the sake of the few people right now who have political power economic power in the i would US. argue the the scale of that is much much greater in countries yeah, like you might China be right and russia You're probably right i mean if you i mean the other thing is like russia and probably china they don't give a they don't give a fuck about what your race is or anything like that or mm-hmm. like where or your your privilege level or anything of that nature russia is proudly a white country <laughs> they want to be and they'll declare that Mm-hmm. They're proud, like they they still say the gays don't exist in in Russia. Yeah, it's, crazy. It's, it's nuts. They're not real. You're right. I tend to not dwell on that often, but that's and so kinda, they don't it's ha- interesting, and they don't have to worry about those social issues because they just fucking don't. Yeah, like people like you have a a gay person in Russia who says I want rights. It's like, oh well, I guess we'll just drag you in the street and beat you to death, and that that's their <laughs> citizens. <laughs> doing yeah. those things here in the United States, we have a certain morality that we try to live by whether, whether it's perfect or not, we still do. Mm-hmm. And that, I mean, for better or worse, it sets us back in, in, in our politics because we're focusing on different things. Yeah. We are focusing on different things and it makes me wonder. I mean, obviously it, it's, it's easy to look at that and go like some of that is, is privilege right it's it's like first world problems i think we have issues with with those things and we don't think about the united states on a global scale because we don't have to but another reason for that is like you know what what, when i went to go see this this speech by roger mcnamee who was an early investor in facebook 
my, he had microphones set up in the front and I went up and asked a question and I said, do you think one of the reasons that we are having a mental health crisis in the United States, or we have all of these gender identity issues in the United States, um, is because, uh, Facebook started in the United States and it's huge here and everyone in the United States is addicted to social media, which is basically just an experiment for you to change your identity temporarily. Hmm. Like people have gotten so comfortable with the idea of I I'm I'm gonna I can pretend to be this for a little while, I can pretend to to have a different name or look different or have a different professional conduct, and none of that has a real any any real implications in the real world at all. Mm-hmm. Can, can I uh, make an analogy? I want to see if you guys agree with this analogy. So if you have a family in a in a tribal situation and it's difficult you know you're you're living in a difficult world and you have a group of children there's a balance between protecting your children from the reality of life and informing them of it right um or, or you could even use the tribe level let's say you know you have the people running the tribe and they're like well we don't leave these people let these people do what they Think do things it's right. kind of the yeah. maternal paternal argument in a way you know okay yeah the maternal wants to protect yeah which is necessary the paternal wants to prepare, okay. you know, yeah. in, in, a, in a very archetypal way. So I think that our society has, has not done the preparing enough. I, I, I've, I think that, Oh yeah, we're soft. We're very, we're very soft and we're, it, it's to the point where we can't, we, when we talk so I, about the realities of the way that most of the world is, yeah. It's like a glazed over sort of like, yeah. yeah, well, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. Right. That's cultural differences. Right. And it's like, right. no, 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 that's normal. Like, that's normal. This shit you have here is not normal. Right. This mm-hmm. is fragile. And, and, and we're trying our goddamn best to protect I, it. I but agree with you. And I like your analogy. I think what I wanted, what I was trying to point out is that social media hasn't helped mm-hmm. resolve. Oh, that, I, I, that I, I think that social media is another. I, I'm going to sound anti-women here, but like another maternal thing. It's like, yeah, let's listen in to how you feel. Let's listen about, and that all matters. I don't want to say it doesn't matter. I mean, it not absolutely on, not on as large a scale as we think it does. It needs to be balanced with a certain amount of, uh, it's very important that how you feel is how you feel, but it's also important for you to know that there are people who want you dead. You yeah. know, like, it's, and the, like, here's, here's the, I think the main, like we talk about this in the air force quite a bit because in the air force, we, we have not faced, um, we're the adversary that actually threatens our air power since world war two. And so there's a lot of discussion in the air force that if we ever got into another conventional, um, warfare type of conflict, we, our air force isn't prepared for that kind of warfare because we've never suffered casualties like that before. Like, we're not used to um, squadrons going up and a fraction of the squadron coming back. Like that doesn't happen anymore. And I think that, I think that's true of the United States as a whole, because we went into the Thunderdome in world war two and we won. And ever since then, it's been a relatively easy ride. Most of the issues we've had have been self-made. We've gotten involved in things we had, we shouldn't have gotten involved with and we fucked ourselves over in social issues. We're not prepared for a true global crisis Mm -mm. and we haven't been for a long time if we got into a conventional war with russia i don't think we'd lose but i don't think we'd be prepared for the carnage of it at all i think think it'd be very long and drawn out yeah Yeah. it would be very long and drawn out and the aftermath would be incredibly difficult and the other thing is we've always had a volunteer military since world war ii or since vietnam rather um people aren't prepared for that either for when that kind of attrition occurs i work with a chinese woman and I love talking to her because, uh, one, she pushes my buttons like on purpose and it's fun. Like mm-hmm. we had, we get it. We like fight a little bit. Um, and I was talking to her and, uh, she was talking about trying to understand what culture is. And I was trying to describe what I see as the thing that makes America so wonderful. Like it, whether it's the best place in the planet to live is subjective. Whether it's the place with the most freedom is not. Like, we definitely have the most freedom on the planet. Um, if you, on average, I'm not saying everybody's equal, but you know what I mean by that. Mm-hmm. Like, I can go outside and say whatever I want. Right. Within 
very little amount of rules. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to describe like the difference between, let's say, China and America is China is far more utilitarian than we are. For them, if it is successful, it is better. But in America, we have an amount of that. We call it pragmatism. You know, you're reading that book. And Mm -hmm. but we also have this this thing that remember that for a sec because now i got to come at it from a different direction america is also criticized for being very religious for the western countries we're probably one of the most religious countries in the in the world in the western world but i think it's necessary and it's good because we have to balance that utilitarianism with this thing called fundamental human rights morality right which yeah. which can't come from utilitarianism like mm-hmm. it, it just can't it's not it's not rational it's not it's not just rational mm-hmm. maybe there's some rationale to it right but it the idea that you as a person matter requires a certain amount of faith because otherwise how do i not excuse letting you, like killing you to save like right. let's say my family, I have a family of of three kids and they each need an organ. Why don't I go, go kill somebody? Like uh, utilitarian, it makes sense. I save mm-hmm. three people by killing one. Why not? And I I think maybe you're I wasn't. On, you're not on that organ harvesting kick, are you? I'm. Just, <laughs> I mean, maybe. But you understand what I mean? Yeah, I think yeah. maybe I wasn't clear before when I was talking about um, Russia and China, countries like that who don't have that moral compass. Th- that that's wrong that they don't have that moral compass. Oh yeah, no, I know. And th- that's what makes the United States a special country is that we do have that moral compass and we do try to include everybody. I mean, it doesn't happen perfectly, but I mean, we're really the only country that's doing it on, on the scale that we're doing it. I agree. And so it, that's a good thing. And I think that's the reason why we're in the position we're in. I was at the time, and I'm going to bring it up now, making an argument for why I get a little nervous about, like, I really like Sam Harris. And I, I read Richard Dawkins, the, the Selfish Gene, and I like him. Mm-hmm. But these new atheists who call religion a mind virus make me a little nervous because... To me, if you get rid of what what is the people who are protecting that that thing that we don't like to talk about, like that sort of where do the rights come from? What's the thing we don't like to talk about? Where do the rights come from? Why should I care about your rights? Like, mm-hmm. where or why do you have rights? How do, do I th- even know who has rights? Do you think that expressly comes from religion these days, or is that just like a common thing that we we believe in this country now? We believe, but why do we believe it? The Constitution. So, it's in the Constitution. All men are created equal, and we have a set of rights that we're endowed to. Why? Or endowed upon us. But why? The Constitution says so. It's, it's the creed of our country. I so I but think. How is that different than I, the Bible th- says so? I think you and I are going to disagree on this a little bit because the Bible is a very different document. You, do you understand? There's an. Uh, can we at least agree on this? There's an aspect of faith required to believe in human rights, because. You can never prove yes. that people have rights. But I don't think faith is um, unique to religion itself. I, think, I, I don't necessarily yeah. either. I'm just saying I think they go a little too far against the idea of believing in something mm-hmm. beyond your ability to rationalize no, it. No, I think I think believing in something bigger than, bigger than yourself is extremely important to, to human development because you have to be- have some extrinsic um, motivation because intrinsically you're imperfect and you're going to do things that are fucked up mm-hmm. because you're a fucking animal and that's just <laughs> what you're going to do. But um, I'm not, I'm not so, so atheist. I'm not, I wouldn't even consider myself an atheist. I don't like the word because of the people you I, just, I know what you're talking about. I'm not, I'm not that kind of person. I would never criticize somebody for being religious. I I'll criticize the institution all day long, probably pretty far into the night as well. But I wouldn't criticize somebody for believing in that. I agree. And I'm, we're on the same page then. Mm-hmm. Like, and it depends on how they use it or how they how they wield that that mm-hmm. faith. I I am totally on the same page with that. I think I I think when when you start attacking story and believing in something without proof, mm-hmm. I think th- 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 that's a slippery slope. Oh yeah, you, yeah. You know, like there are lots of things that we have to believe that we have no evidence of. Mm-hmm. I have no reason to believe that my life means anything. You know, like I have no reason to believe that anything I do means anything. Right, and that that was the operative purpose of religion, I believe, at its at its inception. And I just think that we have diff- we have other vessels that carry that now. 
Yes. And so we don't we don't necessarily need to be so reverent to these institutions. You know? And I like Yeah, I can maybe get behind that. And I, the, the waters are muddied by institutions like Scientology. Yeah, they and are. Things like that who uh, take advantage of like these tax advantages and things like that. And they are terrible, terrible organizations. Well, I agree. And then the other th- and then like the Catholic Church with all these scandals that keep coming out. Like it happened like what once in like the seventies and eighties and everybody's like, Oh, that was weird. Glad that's over. And then it happened again. And then it happened again. Okay. How about this? Whether it's an organized religion or what, whatever a church is, Mm -hmm. I'm glad there are churches in pretty much every city in America, Mm -hmm. whatever it happens to be. I'm glad there's a place that people can go to, to worship the divine or to, you know, ask whatever whatever it doesn't have to be organized religion whatever it is i'm I'm glad that we have that because i feel like if we get rid of that that like there is something to believe in i just think it's a very quick slide from the way we are to the way china is Mm -hmm. there's there's not much separating us from from that yeah i i I still believe in freedom of religion it's in the it's in the documents that i think we should be really adhering to more so than the bible but um, like I agree with you. I think like these like, like I I love that there's a place in Troy. There's several in Troy, where, I mean, not in all the cases, but in some cases the door is always open. Yeah. Like if if you're homeless and you're cold, you can walk into a church and they're probably gonna be like, all right, just don't break anything. <laughs> you know, that's I, I think that's a great thing, mm. and it's and on a small scale, it's I think it's really great, and it's I want to be I want to be sure that I I mentioned that I don't think that all Catholic churches are just havens for child molesters and shit. That's not true. No, it's a systemic problem, but it's mostly on a larger scale. It's, it's something that needs to be addressed within the institution, but I don't, I don't look at a priest and I'm back and think, Oh, I got diddles kids. That's not true. There's something I want to say that sounds so elitist, but the vast majority of people don't think for themselves. They just don't. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think, probably a hundred percent of people are in that space somewhere in life where you're not thinking for yourself. So I would argue we have a lot of people not thinking for themselves in religion. We also have a whole lot of people not thinking for themselves in science, in Mm -hmm. in the, the, the worship of science. So, and I'm not anti-science at all. I love science. I love it. I just don't think it can answer every question. And I don't think, I think you need more to worship. So, what I mean by there being a church in every city, I also want there to be a university. You know, I also, you know, I want there to be both. Mm-hmm. I want there to be a place for people to go to say, I think that when we look at, at the physical universe objectively, we can understand a whole lot about mm-hmm. how, how we should be and how things should go. Well, and I think I, education should be treated the same way religion is. In what way? I think it should be independent of capitalism. It should not. <laughs> it should not be a capital gain system, at all. That's a hard one. I know what you mean. I, well, the, I don't the, know how to solve that problem. The weird thing about it is that it it is only when people make it that way for themselves. Mm-hmm. But you can teach yourself anything if right. you really want, mm-hmm. but you 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 won't you can't capitalize on it until you go to the place that gives you the the, the gatekeeping that document piece of paper, that yeah. says yeah. I think so that's, that's going away, though. I, think I that's really good, think that's going away. Well, I think I think it's going to change a lot. It'll go away, but what? It'll just get replaced by something else. It'll just get replaced. If, one, if there's knowledge out there that people can figure out how to withhold from people until they eventually get yes. capital for eventually, it. Eventually, yes. It's a well, cyclical thing, I think, probably. I think there needs... To, I th- Honestly, I think we need to make education a right. Hmm. And, I mean, we you, you say, how do you do that? Because we're thinking from a capitalist uh, standpoint with it, because it's always been that way. But you just do it the same way you do a church, really. And, like, how do you think churches run? That's a good point. That's a good point. People people value what they're getting from that church, and so they give their money to it. But, this, the, but and, and here's, here's, where, here's the rub for me, because churches are not a perfect institution when it comes to the way they handle their money. Because I, I, I used to sell suits uh, <laughs> for a long time. And we would have this customer come in. He was a he was a priest in Albany, and he was like we were supposed to treat him with a lot of respect. Like my my um my boss was a guy named Mark Goldfarb, very old guy, very traditional. Can I ask where you worked? I okay. worked at uh Mark Thomas okay. Menswear, and he would say he's like when this guy comes in, he's like you refer to him as father, 
and he he gets all this he gets like exemplary service like more so than you would give anybody else because he's been this guy's been in albany a long time and so and mark's been in albany a long time and like he puts this respect in this guy but i could not help but wonder why i was selling this guy a four thousand dollar italian suit and he didn't have to pay taxes on it That's, and he was using church money for it so it's not a perfect institution and there's a lot there but that's just that just hurts yeah that's just that's exactly the same. I have a libertarian friend who would, who has made the same arguments. He was raised Catholic and he was like, well, they don't need this stuff. They don't mm-hmm. need this stuff. No. If they, if they were really doing what they were claiming they were doing, they wouldn't need all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And, they, and that, and the, it's, I think education is a more tangible benefit. That's a I, really good point. Can I give you my spin on this? Mm-hmm. So one of the things I want to study in my graduate research seminar is how does Wikipedia stay afloat the way that it is, right? Wikipedia is this really weird entity. Mm-hmm. It's, it kind of it works the same way you were describing, right? It's just people think it's so valuable. You guys talked about this in the last podcast, right? Yes. Yeah. I brought it up a little bit. People just think it's so valuable that people will give their money voluntarily to this organization mm-hmm. to keep it afloat. It's, it's almost like a, a perfect lens of like socialism it's a it's a snapshot of, of socialism that works for some reason in an otherwise capitalist country right right and that's that, what we're talking about we're talking about socialism and we're talking about but, how it socialism in a responsible society needs to be sprinkled in here's the thing that there's there is some research out there that suggests that millennials or at least people under like a certain age range probably all of us are young enough to to meet the criteria but the people who grew up with digital media or social media or the internet when when you try to poll them and and figure out what their values are what their core values are what they what they value as as people what they want out of their lives we're different from previous generations in that we don't we don't necessarily measure our success or care about what we own physically right a lot of younger people are willing to give up physical possessions for the sake of having experiences that are unique to them Mm -hmm. that they can only talk about with other people in person so even so let's say we tried your model of, of free education right free information you could you could release it but let's once the next step is that is that what capitalism becomes is withholding experiences from people unless you have enough money, Mm -hmm. right? Like you can come on this like two week um, tech diffusion cruise where you just go out into the woods and we all leave our cell phones behind and we just talk to each other for two weeks straight and it's it, right? And, but you pay like five, some uh, doctors will pay like five or 10 grand to go on these trips and completely get rid of their social media or um or what was that what was the word I, I thought of it was like social media or like internet um reversal camps <laughs> it's like right you think if, if this is going to be a thing this is going to be like this is going to be a billion dollar industry when we're all old people right but people in their 40s 50s and 60s are who have lived their entire careers keeping up with the joneses on instagram are going to go i'm sick of it I, I but i'm i'm addicted i can't I don't understand a lifestyle that doesn't involve social media or the internet at all. And they're going to pay people half of their retirement savings to go, how do, how do I remove all of the social media from my life? That's going to be, that's going to be an industry. Mm. People are going to pay money for that. Especially because, 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 because they're all of their friends are going to have all of these experiences. Especially if the world goes the way of China and they're doing like social credit scores. Oh Oh my God. God. That's a thing. Yeah, I know. It's terrifying awful and I, I i could be wrong about this but I, I i think i heard it right i think facebook is the one that bought in and like implemented it that doesn't surprise me or assisted in it see there's there's an issue i'm sorry we're totally de- i'm totally derailing for it, you for know. a second but like that's a problem with tech companies today like they don't i i'm sorry i don't believe they they are more like china like you know what, just, you know what you know what's in scary? general you, don't oh, seem dude. to have a moral co- actually you know what youtube kind of does YouTube actually seems to care. They had it, yeah, it's slightly more than most of the other ones. Didn't Google you, buy YouTube? It did, yeah. but they they're pretty separate. It seems, mm-hmm. and you, YouTube at least trying. You know, they at least at least seems to be like 
I'm trying not to trying not to infect bias, but also trying to recognize the problem of mm -hmm. the reach they have and how people use it. And didn't Google open a headquarters in China? Uh, probably. I, th I, I mean, that, that's not a fact, probably. but I, I'm, a, I'm I, not saying I like they, they deserve might. to be just blindly trusted. But as far as the big Silicon Valley companies go, YouTube, I at least have more evidence that they're trying. That they're mm -hmm. trying to adjust their algorithms and things, and it's not perfect. What? But I don't trust Facebook. I don't trust Twitter. Good. I don't trust Google. I don't trust. I think Apple's one of the worst ones. Well, they're capitalists, like, <laughs> and that's well. I don't, see, seriously, you have to. That's how you have to look at it. That, pure that, capitalists. That is yeah. what is has sunk into me recently. Now, like I, I, I've told you, I haven't read George Orwell's 1984. I only just started it, and I'm probably getting to it a little late in life, but. I've always been one of those people that goes like, oh, who cares if people can see all my information? Like, I don't care if the government knows I, whatever, sent X Y Z email or, you know, paid someone some cash for marijuana crap like that. It's like I don't, I don't, it doesn't bother me that my privacy is being infringed upon because I've never been the sort of conspiracy theorist who like doesn't like the government, right? Mm. And when I went to go see this speech by that early Facebook investor, he said one of the biggest concerns he has he had right now was that Facebook was taking user data and selling it and when he explained it this way all of a sudden it started to make sense like let's let's these websites for instance right they'll they'll, they'll keep track of your mouse movements and it's gotten to the point where where like obviously it's in a lot of tech companies interests to know if human beings are looking at their websites or if bots are looking at their websites so they figure out if they figured out how to analyze um mouse movements to the point that they can figure out if you're a person or if you're a bot without having to do any verification nonsense, right? Hmm. And, he goes, and then he thought he thought to himself, like, well, what if what if Facebook or Twitter or any any of these companies that that track my mouse movements, wh what if you could pick out a pattern that says, oh, this per this person is developing tremors, right? This person is getting unhealthy, right? And then he goes, like, well, wouldn't it be really? I I'd really hope that those companies were bene benevolent enough to like send me alert an alert and say like, you should look into that. And save yourself grief, save yourself money, and save this the society. You know, do the the just thing would be to start developing something that tells people like you might have, drivers, you might be prone to a stroke or something, right? Right. But he goes in reality, if if Facebook did with that data what they've been doing with all of their other user data, they would just sell it. They would sell it to an ad company that that will now advertise to this person health insurance, mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden, wanting your personal data not to be sold and to, and to not even be examined in the first place becomes this huge moral crisis because people are just going to sell it. There are these things called, um, I, it's not feedback bubbles, but but that's a good word to describe. It's like some kind of bubble is the word they use for it, right? It's, it's like advertising companies kind of realized that if you, it, there's so much content on the internet, it's really hard to sell things. Mm -hmm. But... Um, Let's say you Google firearms once or you, you Google bourbon or whiskey or something, right? Um, then I, I mean, we're all kind of aware of this, right? Our ads are now keyed into our search words and words that are picked out of our email and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But what ends up happening is we see those ads and subliminally we go like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe I should shop for some bourbon. Or like, you know, I've always kind of wanted to spend a lot of money on a firearm or just or whatever it is you want to buy, right? That those advertisements fuel the 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 inquiry and the shopping addiction that's the goal and then you but then you keep looking those things up and your advertisements become more and more concentrated to to get you to buy certain things and all all of your user data goes into this the, the, the stuff that's on your google profile the stuff that you look up on youtube um what you're sending to in private chats on facebook what you're posting about on facebook who you follow on twitter all of this information is used by someone, marketing companies, tech companies, to figure out how to tailor the in internet so that it someone can make money off of the data, mm -hmm. yep. right? And that's what that's all of a sudden. And when he explained it to me that way, it, it was all of a sudden it was like I don't really care about my my personal privacy, right? If I can Google, you know, if I just if people can Google stuff about me, I don't care. But all of a sudden, it's like. That, that could be ha really harmful to me, right? right? It could be harmful to my mental health. It can be harmful to Your my wallet. Yep. Yeah. And so, isn't it interesting that this the internet is this infinite entity that human beings just 
came of and created, but most of us probably only visit two, three, four sites when we go on. Now we do, yeah. <laughs> So Isn't that interesting? All, all of those big websites have figured so out how weird. to concentrate the most attractive con- content onto mm-hmm. them. Yeah, it's but like it's a this Price's infinite Law. world we can go to, and we only go to these few places. Mm-hmm. Is it right? Price's Law? Is that the right word? The, the um, it's very nature works the same way. Eighty percent of the work is done by twenty percent of the people, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But it, it, you find it in everything because once something works, everybody keeps going to it. And then there's less room, reason to try anything else. Mm-hmm. So you constantly you concentrate all of the attention. And that's and the, these tech companies are just our modern uh, steel and oil companies. It's they're yeah, they're just these big trusts that I mean now they're speak they're talking about breaking them up, but it's it, it's a different kind of entity because it's you know what's it's funny is is like by tr- by traditional measures it's been hard for governments to look at at facebook and google and go like oh we need to install some antitrust measures right mm-hmm. because in terms of i mean i'm sure in terms of, of revenue and market share they're huge right but just by because because of the fact that they just don't function that's the exact same way that uh, that other businesses do on paper in terms of financial statement it's hard to it's hard to come up with the legal justification that we need to break up facebook that but, and but then, our, our country our government has not been in the trust busting business for a long time no, not they at have all. abdicated in that duty right yeah. what happened to teddy roosevelt uh i thought i thought for a little while that trump might be something like that you know like i don't love the guy but you know no, they There's, they should have broken up the banks in 2008. They didn't do it. Oh, they absolutely should have broken up the banks in 2008. That was why I voted for Obama. Like, I was huge into Obama in college. I read both his books. I was, like, all about him. Mm-hmm. And and then he got elected, and the, and the shit hit the fan, and I was like, holy shit, you're just another one of them. Like, that was my, mm-hmm. my attitude at the time was like, you're just another one of them passing the fucking buck. You know, you don't want the shit to go down while you're the president. So you're going to do shit to make sure this happens again. And I hated it. And it, it was, was going to happen it, again. It, it, I hated it. And I got really mad at him soon. for it. On the marketing thing, I want to bring up an idea I was thinking about. So a lot of marketing, I'd say advertising. Get down. A lot of advertising is uh, attention grabbing. You know, like you, you want to make your, your advertisement needs, if it stands, you want people to remember your advertisement. And if your advertisement stands out against other advertisements, people will remember it. That's why you get advertising trends. Like maybe the original advertisements were actually talking about the product, like actually saying you should buy my product because this. And then you had this old thing where like somebody was like, I'm actually not going to talk about my product at all. I'm just going to, you know, sell the idea of the product. Then that became the whole marketing scheme. Mm -hmm. Then in the 90s, you had the whole uh, crazy, um, I don't know, like just mountain dew and like surge this is like right and then there's like this the self-aware ads whatever so one of the the advertising trends now that makes companies stand out that concerns me is this sort of uh, virtue signaling advertisement technique which comes in a couple ways the obvious one is the gillette ad that people had so much of an issue with right but the other way that i think is far more insidious is there's this advertising in the way of pulling your ads so you just sit and you wait around for Fox News to say something that you're like, if we pull our ads for this, all the other news networks are going to cover us and we're going to be seen as this wonderful company. And then we're not paying for ads, but we're getting all sorts of advertisements mm. for it. And that scares me in a way. That makes me a little nervous because I don't I don't find that there's something about that morally repugnant to me because it's it's insinuating you care about something that I just don't believe they care about. I don't I don't believe for a second that any of these companies give a shit at all Mm -hmm. i think they think that it's going to make money and to sell yourself as a virtuous company i think but why does that concern you because i mean that's that's what they're there for that's everything they do is to make money so you know they're gonna you know they're gonna do that you know that's why they're doing that it concerns me because because it activates reactionary culture which we already have a problem Mm -hmm. with it it makes it worse if that makes sense. No, it does. Yeah. Like, and I, it, I agree with you. It, it's just like this, pro- the problems always existed. We just haven't seen that. It's a problem. That's true. I guess that's true. That's true. I guess, I guess in the past, in my, in my mind, you've always been able to say, well, companies are just out there making money. But now mm-hmm. it seems like there's a whole lot of people who think that these companies actually care. Right. 
And here's here's I mean, this is my personally it's scary because they're treated like they're people, these companies. Mm-hmm. Where they're they're given all these um considerations and things by our government, but they're not. They're there to make money. They don't care about this country. They don't care about the citizens of this country. So I had an interesting thought the other day that another impact social media has is that even people think that these companies are like people, right? Because they're not. They, they're, they kind of are. I mean, they're, well, they're groups they're of people. Kind of but a, I mean, an they, organism. Let's, they, uh, let's say they're organ. Right. But I mean, one of one of one of the side effects when Facebook got really big. One of the reasons it, it was a smash hit above and beyond other social media platforms that had inv- invented up to the point was that you needed a, um, like a, a, an EDU email, right? You had to have your school email to sign up the very first time you used Facebook. And that added a, like a level of credibility to it. It's like, oh, I know this person is this person and I'm going to add them as friends on Facebook. Every other social media platform that existed up to that point, it made sense for a little while. People would, you know make friends, add one another, and then the trolls get on and they start, they commit identity theft. They, uh, you know, pretend to be other people or they, or there would just be like nonsense, like just memes, meme accounts or whatever. And that would just would eventually over time erode the experience. And every social media experiment that had happened up to the point of Facebook suffered from that. Facebook was very successful at first because it was designed to literally be an internet identity representation of who you actually were. Mm-hmm. Eventually, that went away. And that's why you hear old, you know, older, older people who had a taste of the, the first Facebook complain about it now because they said, well, once, once they got rid of that requirement and anyone could get a Facebook as whoever, trolls took over. And, and the, the point of this is, is, is this, right? That, that, they're, they're, I, don't, I mean, maybe I don't know if you guys remember this specifically, but there's always that one person in high school, like for, like when Facebook was normal for like a year or two and you'd put your real name, your first name, and your last name and a picture of you as your Facebook profile and it all made sense. And then there was, there was that one, but you had like maybe like a, a weird gamer forum account where you just like I had a picture of like some logo and your name was like smash bomber 7707 and it had, it didn't have to, it was the point was that it was anonymous. It didn't have to be anything about you. It was just the, the avatar you used to represent you on some forum Mm -hmm. that's what i was like as a teenager anyway yes but then there was this there was that one weird kid in school who had had like an anime like profile picture on facebook and their name was like some chinese character you know right and you go like what you're fucking weirdo what are you doing this This is facebook just pretend you be your actual self (laughs) Mm -hmm. but and they started out as the weirdo and then there was a then there was a class clown that did it and then like an actual like kind of like funny person and then it slowly took over and all of a sudden like everyone had like a funny account or everyone just would change we would be them but they would change their full name on on facebook i, I went by my middle name for a little a little while on facebook because it was like yeah why not everyone's there, doing it there definitely was a that that like, yeah I, I was we in went Siena through... when when we when sienna got yeah. facebook okay. like like it was I don't oh. know, a little while after like all the ivy league schools yes. got them and then they started getting so only yes. colleges had them and it was a thing. It was a Jeez. thing. There was an exclusivity part to it, right? But there was also that aspect of once they let in high schools, it was like, uh, now I don't know. Like it's not tied to an email address that, like, yeah. you're, you're, you're anyone can just do it, right? And the problem with this is, right? We we developed a sense that even even in our serious online identities, all of it could be made up if we really wanted it to be. We could mm-hmm. try to make it and be internet famous if we wanted. We could be trolls. We could be class clowns, and it was easy to get a c- attention to do that. It's it really wasn't hard to figure out how to be how to manipulate an audience, making a Facebook page, right? But here, but the, the the main point is right is that we came up with the idea that there was us as people. Like there's me. I have my career goals and my ambitions and and my personal relationships. And then there's all this bullshit internet stuff. Corporations figured out that corporations had always really been this all along. Companies could have an internet identity and they could just be fluff. They could be made up. They could be what they could paint, whatever kind of identity they wanted. And all of a sudden this comp like Arby's is a blue check Mark on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wendy's. And all of a sudden any, Moon, any, any company, any company, no. any company. Could, could yeah. <laughs> you really should. I, can I, I want to say something before you, like you, you just said, corporations figured out like you said that that implies a human 
That, uh, no, there was, I, I'm, right, not, yes. I'm not saying they are. I just yeah. want to, I just want to, in my, obviously I, like it was a mix of academia and capital interest. Sure. And, but, sure. Uh, but the point is you understand there are motivations. Yeah. There are incentives. Right. And the corporation behaves like a thing that is none of the people in it, but is everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. And, so I think of corporations as like human. They're like Frankenstein's monster. Well, like, here they're, here, they're, they're, they're sort like, of this they're thing. They're like human. They are, but here's the problem. In that every they're they're they're, they're I don't I don't want to. They're human, and that every every person that's alive wants to survive. And corporations mm. obviously have an interest do in surviving. They? Do they? But <laughs> they don't want to. But they keep they're, doing it. It's they're if, the thing. If I, if, I, if, I, I, if I kind corp, of I kind of see them as this sort of corp, uh, corporations. Though the difference is that they do it by keeping their bottom line black and not red. Yeah, that's it. That's the only difference. They figured out a way to quantify survival. Whereas it's, humans don't really have to do that. You just you get hunger, you put food in your stomach. Okay, you know how people are worried about AI. Yeah. Okay, co corporations are AI. They're kind they're man-made things that think on their own. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it, it, it it's it's it, it's a crime against God for they're lack like, of a better they're term. They're like hive minds, but yeah, they they're like the thing. They're parasites, and they appear to be human beings to achieve their ends, which is making more money. This is where I look. So I'm gonna take I'm gonna try to stick to science because I don't want to go down the religious route here. Mm -hmm. So science, let's say evolution. Human beings survived. You're such a bully. Everyone's scared of you. Um, the human being survived because something something that we'll never fully understand worked is working. So we have we have a certain we have a certain unity, but also variety that allows us to work really well on this planet. Where we can we can we have we're very smart. But we also have different types of people. So we have we talked about risk takers last time, yeah. and how I bet you there's lots of times in history where the risk takers exist, but it's not a good strategy. Yeah. Right. But our but our genes keep producing these types of people for all these different types of situations that have time has time and existence has made clear that that gene should continue. You know, real conditions told the genes in us to say okay maybe we don't need everyone to be a risk taker but every every thousand people we need a serious risk taker or something like that i'm oversimplifying or it. or 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 everyone really has that compulsion to take a risk and that's just the that but then it's but that's it's, a strategy that was picked by something not us that's well, a strategy that's that was the thing is it's all 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 the successful risk takers are are everyone else who's a risk taker fails and they're the one person who succeeds in their taking risk by chance but do, do you understand the distinction i'm making the, the the when 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 a certain uh species survives nature selects it yes you know it's selected because it's it's wants to live best yes. but corporations are not selected by nature like they're selected well, unless by, unless you think that consumers are a natural phenomenon. I just I have a hard time. I don't see. I don't. Well, the market is nature. It's a, the market is a is its its own like ecosystem. It's nature. Yeah. I, I guess I don't see That's the idea. I don't see corporations as having. Well, you got to separate. They're them. not good for the ecology not, of the planet. I, I, I don't. They, I don't. I don't think corporations have they exist, as much ingrained desire to continue living. They don't. But they don't. They, they, they want don't, to grow. They don't, they don't, they don't necessarily don't, want to continue living. They don't have they, right. Well, they could terminate. One. One. One just happens to ride. The hand point hand is, they're the they're they are subject to I don't the know nature. That's true. It does. I mean, if you're growing, you're you're surviving. Com co companies but, but what, what companies growing... are subject to survive in the nature of the environment that they exist in. The okay. same way humans are subject to survive as long as possible. We've had periods of plague. You know, we've had periods of serious, like close to extinction events, right? And something in our genes managed to get through. The thing that we kept. The thing that we've kept helped us get through i don't see that true as for corporations so here's here's what i think you're doing you're you're look you're you're looking at corporations as though they play by the same rules as like a human or an animal in nature no, I'm, well, i agree they don't which is why i think of them as abominations they're not they're not in their 
they exist in the market. The market is their their nature. Corporations can sure. only so the, the the I'm sorry the okay. the market is selecting them to survive. The market being all of us consumers. Fully agree with you. And so the market changes and ebbs and waves like an uh, ecosystem does, and that's 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 where their selection lies is in the market. It's still the market is an abomination, just like companies are an abomination. I think we're I think we're all agreeing on the same thing. We're just kind of. Um, fighting over the semantics. Well, I, I want yeah. to tell you one of my favorite jokes that I think kind of like might help you it, maybe like change your opinion or, or maybe alter it. Maybe not to agree with me, but it might enlighten. I your... think we do agree. Well, okay. Well, maybe we do. My One of my favorite jokes I heard of all time, I read it on the internet. Spoilers. But um, it was uh, it was just something that was like really, it's really cheesy. It's not funny until you like think about it for half a second. It was like, um, what did Obama say to Joe Biden uh, day after being inaugurated into the presidency of the United States. My authority is imagined. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a joke. It's not a joke as much as it is you think about it and you go like, oh shit. It's, okay. it's like, like, like all, all he had to do to be as successful and powerful as he was, was get the right sequence of words to come out of his mouth over his lifetime. Yeah, just convince, her, just convince <laughs> that's, everybody. That that's all he had to do. Everyone else just had to give up their oh, power yeah, to get, him. Yes, right. Yes. And corporations are also the same. They, they're just legal entities. They're pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. They're literally pieces of paper. And the, the only reason we allow them to function as corporations is because we have a faith in society that, that the, the way society is ordered, first of all, is like good or benevolent, but also because like, like we, we just accept corporations to continue being corporate. We we like we like that that the legal entity can exist, so we let them exist. I don't want to sound like I'm anti-corporation because I'm not. I think I, I I like I have I, this was made by Google. Yeah. Like I'm I'm not I'm not anti-corporation. No, I don't think I'm not trying to say that you were. But what I'm trying to say is that corporations left to their own devices will destroy themselves we wouldn't do that i mean we might to a point well what do you mean i don't by, think well, i don't think we would as individual people i mean we can't prolong our lives forever we have to do we mu we naturally deteriorate faster than we can nourish ourselves the, and, the and, gene? And, and i think corporations even the corp the difference is corporations can theoretically live on forever because the people that run them can die but be or can be replaced indefinitely forever but the market conditions that might make a corporation successful it's very unlikely that they would exist yeah, forever. it's based on ideas yeah. it, it corporations live within the world the universe right. of ideas but a gene your genes i'm sorry i get so like into the gene thing okay. but like your genes can they don't care if they have I to see, shrink yes like they don't like yeah they don't care they really don't your, your genes we care we humans right. care yeah. but your genes basically say yeah. i don't care the conditions that make me survive in fact if we shrink it's kind of better for me if i survive and we shrink that's awesome for me mm. you know but a corporation growth supersedes mm -hmm. survival yeah it's about well growth. Hold, it's about hold, growth hold, first hold and foremost that's Gro what growth, I'm is growth is what attracts shareholders and growth is what makes shareholders happy which makes management and boards of directors and ceos happy but there's no law that says like a company grows and grows and grows and reaches maturity and then all of its retained earnings just become dividends from there from there on out and right so it's, it ceases to grow and the shareholders just get the leftover the residual income and it stops growing that's a, that doesn't happen often but there are companies that have reached maturity and then just stop growing because there's no more economy of scale for them to continue growing. And even and even if a company shrinks, right, that might not make the stock look very good. But, but at the end of the day, like the bottom line is still what keeps the company afloat, not how happy the owners are. Don't you think are. it would be better if they died eventually? I mean, I, I don't, I, I I don't sound know if there's a better so, or worse. I, I sound so fatalist there, but I feel like, let's say this company reaches reaches maturity and it's been going on its dividends, but like, everything at that point is based on a point in time that no longer exists and it's not in its own benefit. Uh, it depends. It, it just, you, like, there's, there's, there's a, a level, new... there's a level of, if it's not broken, don't fix it. That can I apply. sound like such a socialist that, that, right now. No, but, no, no, no. I think but, there's, <laughs> I think, I think there are some corporations that might offer services that are so fundamental to the economy, yeah. like railroads, transportation, oil. Yeah. 
they they'll probably just be here forever That's they might true. change their names they their ownership will certainly change and the assets they control yeah. will change i, I do want to i do want to say I, I have i am actually not as socialist as i'm taking the position i i am in i actually was a kind of an anarchist for a while i was like serious libertarian right. for a while uh i just i'm starting because it's in my industry you know I understand tech. I yeah. understand Silicon Valley. I understand what's going on. Yeah. And that scares the living shit out of me. Right. So in this realm, I feel like, yes, regulate this. Like, there's a part of me that is like, I don't trust these people. I think they're evil. I think they don't. Well, maybe evil's the wrong word. They, they I, I think they, they can't handle their yeah. own evil. They're amoral. They don't. Even if they're wonderful people, they can't handle the potential for evil they have. Right. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the uh, these tech companies and social media companies need a system of checks and balances. Yeah, they do. I talked to a guy last but we, night. We would never. We they, it's uh, these these social media companies should be public utilities. They should be like the way I resist a, that so the way much. AT and T. Well, it's like I. I mean, you're right. I understand. There's there's something scary about that, right? But it's like the internet hasn't existed long enough that there is are stratified sections of the internet that are like right in a way like you, wikipedia is a public utility or like there's a public authority right mm -hmm. there are, there are different types there are different categories of corporation like so the in, in albany the cdta the bus system here is like they exist to make a profit but also um they exist because the government you know the the low the city government has made a contract with them right. and ensures their survival and can kind of make the rules about how cdta operates it's a hybrid it's a hybrid of government yeah i gotta and, run all right, all right, all right, all right. yeah we, we've been talking for like <laughs> at least two and a half hours yeah um i yeah i think there's a lot more to be yeah there certainly is about there here. certainly is it's a it's a it's a never-ending um conversation uh you want to finish but i mean you were you were you want to well finish i'm just were... saying i'm just saying you know the way i look at it social all, a lot of these social media platforms propagated via capitalism but kind of so did a lot of our public utilities that we now see as either oligopolies or just or just is it a universal thing this that... is two this is now two industries in this conversation we've talked about socializing we talked about education and silicon valley mm -hmm. tech companies I'm just playing devil's advocate here. I mean, I, I get nervous about it. Well, it's, it's weird. Like once I, once, I just made the opposite argument. Once and <laughs> humanity, again, like our resolution of history is so big that we can, we can imagine things on a national scale. And now that humanity can, can see how big humanity is and go like, oh, there are some things that everyone should just have. We just go like, why not regulate it, socialize it, give it to everyone, mm -hmm. you know? I don't, I don't, I don't know that. Um, there are things that we can see having such a big economy of scale that we think it's oh, it's more rational to just have, let make sure everyone has it. I don't know that social media is a necessity that people need to have. I think education and healthcare. It's not so much that I think people need to have it. I just think it's it's more dangerous that that's it's capitalized. That's what I'm scared of. Mm -hmm. Like part of me thinks actually we're at the breaking point, and these things, these companies are going to fail. Like Twitter's in trouble, and we should. Twitter's not growing Let anymore. Let them it's, fail because the market doesn't depend on them. I I agree with you. That's the libertarian. The libertarian in me comes out and says, "You tried something. You were successful for a while. You took it too far. We're done with it. Yeah, it's we're you're done. Sorry, mm -hmm. something else will come. Gab is big now. You know, blockchain's gonna change everything. Um, all right, somebody somebody close this out because otherwise we're just gonna keep talking. Oh, yeah, we could keep talking about this forever. Um, all right, I mean, I, I, but that's that's just about, I mean, it was another wonderful discussion about social media and the internet and all the horrible things related to it. But hopefully, <laughs> next we kind of went full circle there. Yeah. We started with Instagram, we came back to Twitter. And Maybe next week we'll have a more rosy view of it all. Probably not. No. <laughs> Given the nature of the world today. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks. Of course.